May I please have a motion to approve the agenda as circulated, including the additional items? Mayor Maracas, Councillor Kim, any questions or comments on the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor? Approved. Uh, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, I'll move on to community presentations. We have uh, just the one community presentation this evening. I'd like to call up uh, Franco DeMarco, Recreation Sup Supervisor for Community Programs regarding Recreation and Parks Month. Mr. DeMarco, just to remind everybody your name and remind you that you have five minutes for your presentation. Hopefully that's enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good evening, Mayor Maracas and all members of council. Uh, my name is Franco DeMarco. I'm the Recreation Supervisor for Community Programs with the Town of Aurora. I'm here tonight to speak to you about Juno's Recreation and Parks Month, a great initiative that we in the Community Services Department take great pride in and are proud to celebrate annually. Established in 2005, Juno's Recreation and Parks Month, or JRPM, is an annual community mobilization movement that takes place in parks, schools, recreation centers, and neighborhoods across Ontario. JRPM is an exciting way to increase community engagement and awareness around the value and important benefits of recreation and parks to individuals, families, and communities. Objectives include increased community awareness and community engagement. The Town of Aurora is fortunate to have a variety of recreation and park systems providing countless recreational opportunities for both residents and visitors. JRPM allows the town to showcase the wide variety of programs and services it offers while encouraging and promoting active and healthy lifestyles for residents. The research shows us that participation in both structured and unstructured recreation, sport, and cultural activities improves physical, psychological, and emotional health. Parks, trails, and recreation uh, participation builds family unity, social capital, they strengthen volunteer and community development, enhance social interaction, and create community pride and vitality. Further, recreation programs, services, and parks reduce health care and social service costs. They serve to boost the economy, enhance property values, attract new business, and increase local tourism. 98, according to Parks and Recreation Ontario, 98% of Ontarians believe that recreation and parks are essential services that benefit their entire community, and 97% of Ontario households use local parks. So this upcoming month, a uh, full listing of town programs and events can be found on our website at aurora.ca slash recreation and parks month. Activities that we've planned include yoga and Zumba in the park, basketball, rock climbing, leisure swim, public skate, and much more for the community. There's something for all ages and abilities. We encourage everyone interested in learning more about this initiative to visit our website and view the schedule posted online. Hard copies of the schedule will also be available at the Stronic Aurora Recreation Complex, Aurora Family Leisure Complex, Town Hall, and the Aurora Senior Center. So how can you participate? Pick up your Juna's Recreation and Parks Month passport anytime after May 27th at either the Aurora Family Leisure Complex, Stronic Aurora Recreation Complex, Aurora Senior Center, or Town Hall through Access Aurora. Then either visit the town's website for our schedule activities or pick up a hard copy of the schedule from each of these designated locations. There are four types of activities, each coinciding with your passport. Sport, fitness, parks and trails, and social activities. Record the activities you've completed on your passport, and once you've completed all four types of activities, submit your completed passport by June 30th to be eligible to win a $50 credit for a Town of Aurora Recreation Program. The town also wants to see how the community is celebrating Recreation and Parks Month on their own, with family, friends, and neighbors. So submit any photos related to JRPM to the town on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram using our hashtag AuroraJRPM19. Those who submit their photos to the town on social media will be eligible to have their photo published in an upcoming Aurora Community Services Program Guide. As part of the town's JRPM initiative, the town will also be uh, participating in the Participation Community Better Challenge in partnership with Sport Aurora and Activate Aurora. The Participation Community Better Challenge is a brand new annual physical activity challenge that is bringing communities together with physical activity and sport participation. The challenge takes place between May 31st and June 16th. As the two initiatives pair so well together, the town will be integrating the Community Better Challenge into its existing JRPM celebrations. The town encourages the community to participate and support our community's effort to be crowned Canada's most active community. Challenge participants will be able to track their active minutes, which will contribute to our community's total on either the free participation app or on the participation website. 
The town will also be logging minutes for its existing recreation programs that, occurring during these, that occur during these dates, and these active minutes will be put towards our community's total count. More information about the Participation and Community Better Challenge can also be found on our JRPM webpage at aurora.ca slash recreation parks month. On behalf of the Community Services Department, we invite Mayor Maracas and all of Council to come out and participate in all the fun activities that we have planned throughout the month of June. Thank you for your time. We hope to see the community out this upcoming month celebrating recreation and parks with us. Thank you, Mr. Marco. Well done, and you've kept it under five minutes. That's even a bonus this evening. Um, can I get a motion to receive the presentation? Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Gartner. Uh, Councillor Humphreys, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. DeMarco, for showing uh, us what's happening in the next uh, few weeks, and it's really exciting. Just a quick question. Is this the first time we've done something like this? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. No, it's not, uh, Councillor Humphreys. Um, okay. We've done it, as far as I know, I think dating back to maybe oh, even 2010. Where have I been? Um, <laughs> so a little while. It's an annual initiative, um, and um, the branding looks different this year, so they updated it, maybe it's the colors. Um, but That's it, why. It, it does look different, um, <laughs> but it is something that we're happy to celebrate uh, annually. Um, a lot of programs um, that we're offering, again, um, are backed by popular demand, and we see some great engagement in the community with that. Oh, perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I did... I, all kidding aside, I, I know that we've done it, but it seems different this year. The approach seems different. I don't know why. Just uh, um, maybe you can give me a hint to why, because I think recreation in parks is one thing. It's always parks and rec, right? So just, I don't know if that's what yep. got my... Um, so through Sorry. you, Mr. Chair, um, <laughs> so the Recreation and Parks Month initiative is through Parks and Recreation Ontario. Um, okay. We've kind of changed our marketing um, there you go. For, for this year. That's correct. Um, we started a little earlier, um, and... Um, and the passport idea is also back from previous years. The Community Better Challenge is something new that we're doing this year. So some similarities, but definitely some differences. Absolutely. You know, it yeah. sounds really great. Yeah. sounds like a refresh and a revive, you know, sort of a, you know, refreshing perspective. Um, just one last question to you, Mr. Chair. Um, is there any age limits on this participation? Through you, Mr. Chair, no, there's not. The whole so community is welcome to participate. So our schedule that is available online um, has the full list of the programs, the locations, and the ages per program. Um, but we have options from preschool through to our older adults. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Councillor Gardner. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like a lot of work has been done to make this successful. So what is the most popular activity? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, <coughs> I, I say our, our seniors information and active living fair uh, is one of them. Um, so that also is uh, something that we're doing again this year. It's on Saturday, June 1st at the Aurora Senior Center. Um, and, and we have a great attendance there. Um, some of our leisure swims are, are really well attended, our public skates. Um, so there's a variety, um, but I would say off the top of my head that our active living fair in June is, is definitely one of them. So do we put on more public swims and skates during this month? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so these JRPM programs are in addition to our regular operating hours. Um, so most of which are free unless they're otherwise indicated on the schedule available online. Um, so the, the couple of swims that are on the schedule are in addition to um, our, our regular schedule. Sounds great. Uh, could you just say one more time how people get passports? Great, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Gardner. Um, they are available and will be at uh, either Town Hall, the Stronic Aurora Recreation Complex, the Aurora F Family Leisure Complex, or the Senior Center. So those are our four designated locations. As of Monday, May 27th, um, they can pick them up in person at each of those desks. Um, but for those that are unable to come in in person or for convenience would rather print from home, we also have the passport as a printable PDF on our website. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank and to you. all the staff. Thank you, just Mr. DeMarco. And, and I hope you let all council know how successful the month of June is uh, upon completion. Definitely. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor of receiving? Carried. Thank you again. Uh, we have two delegations this evening. Our first delegation is Bruce Corman, CEO of the Aurora Public Library. Bruce, I know you, you know the drill, but please state your name and, and let us know. I'll let, I'll let you know that you have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. My name is Bruce Gorman. I'm the CEO of the Aurora Public Library. And I'm here tonight in support of the report that you're going to see in just a few minutes on the Library Square linkage. 
So I was uh, last in front of you um, on that great evening when the library square was approved. And during that uh, meeting, we talked a little bit about the concept of a linkage between the library and the um, new Church Street edition. And we went away and worked hard, and Mr. Natarozny, Ms. McDougal, myself, the consultants, um, spent some quality time trying to map out what this may look like. Um, and that's what occurred, that's what you're gonna see tonight. And what you're gonna see is pretty remarkable. It certainly exceeded all my expectations. Stilling minor thunder here, you'll see some of these pictures in a few minutes um, from the consultants. This completes the library square from my perspective. It makes it full, it makes it wholesome, it makes this place where people can meander back and have a whole lot of experiences within the same uh, structure. Um, to me, this is what we need to do to complete library square to make it, to maximize what it can be. Um, that was just a view of the outside. Here's a view of the inside, I believe looking towards the library. I've done a lot of construction projects in my, in my day and one of my biggest regrets is always not doing something during the project that wouldn't have cost a lot of money, relatively speaking, um, to the grand amount of money or the impossibility of doing it at a later date. So I think now is an opportunity to seize this moment and uh, move forward with this link. I've talked a lot about the global benefits. Um, I just wanted to touch base a little more specifically on the benefits from my perspective, from the Woodstock, or from the, sorry, Aurora Public Library's perspective. For us, obviously, increased traffic flow with more people coming to that gener general area is good for me, which would um, increase my gate count. Having more people in, my, in the, the library is, is great um, for, for us and for the community as well. It's more of a, I call it a unified destination, a place where the community can come together to do a lot of things and maybe they're doing multiple things. Maybe they're taking in a movie at my library and then taking in a great event um, somewhere else in the square. I think that's powerful. I'm gonna talk in a minute or two about the possibility of, of conventions too, which I think is important. Um, the third bullet there is similar. We, we can collaborate and, and work closer together and use this space for the greater good. I think bringing us together um, is an important part of why we would do this. So we would want to use the fabulous auditorium for some of our programming too, as maybe the, the town would like to use some of our rooms. Uh, we're creating new rooms, as you know, but this is an opportunity for us to share space and if we'd like to do some great events like we do lots of great events um, and we want to use the auditorium, that would be a perfect opportunity for us to walk across this enclosure and put on some great programming in the auditorium. So, um, Councillor Gallo will like this Next one in that I think the economies of having our mutual benefit together, um, all of the people that we all bring to the table, using our economies for, for lots of different things, including um, enhanced food service, which I think would be uh, really good for the, uh, for the whole area to have food service. And for me too, and parking has been a really big issue. Um, for us to say that you can park up in the parking lot in the, um, by the 22 Church Street edition and then walk to our library in an enclosed environment, um, I think that's powerful too, rather than say someone has to park on the street and walk outdoors. Oh my gosh, okay. So that's some of the benefits of the bridge. Um, this, um, if you'll indulge me, um, is the corridor. That's something that you haven't seen yet. This is a corridor that goes from the bridge across to Young Street. I just want to direct your attention to the brick enclosure outside. Um, there's two of them. Um, and I hear from a very reliable source that they were both originally designed to be program rooms. Um, they are mechanical rooms now, housing, housing all the mechanical, so I'm going to take a closer look at that, that. But if that was the case, this corridor would provide um, easy access to those two new meeting rooms. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if we were to have events, conferences in this global space and have the auditorium as the primary spot and breakout rooms as maybe the two breakout rooms up there and then another two downstairs in our library. We have uh, 200 or so uh, hotel rooms 
going into this town shortly. Bruce, if I can just stop you for a minute. Council, can I get a motion just to extend? Councilor Humphreys, Councilor Kim, all in favor? Go ahead, Bruce. Thank you so much, I'll be quick. So I think that's pretty powerful and I think this corridor would definitely provide easy access to this notion of having conventions in this, um, in this town and conventions are, are, are powerful in that they bring people to one specific area and lock them in for a period of time and I think there's lots of opportunities for us to do that here in Aurora. Corridor benefits for the library from our perspective outdoor public space as you saw in that previous picture there so an outdoor deck which is uh, I think lovely people usually love to grab a coffee and sit outside um, the meeting rooms I just mentioned this is important too um, the mayor talks about this quite a bit having a, a gateway to Young Street as Young Street matures as we have more um, medium density housing as it becomes more walkable I think that's a lovely entryway into the library square uh, from Young Street so I think that's a that's powerful it's a new uh, destination, a new place for people to go in the library. It'll be um, uh, visually interesting. We'll put some chairs and another place to read or relax or do whatever that you'd like to do. Um, and then improved parking for library customers is a bullet that I should have pulled off, but I was just doing this this afternoon, so I apologize for that bullet. Here's a rendition of the actual, um, and you'll see this in the report too, um, the entryway, the vestibule. Um, I just wanted to show you what this would look like. So you would be able to see this better from Church Street as the entryway to the library. It's in keeping with the look and feel in my opening comments where I love how this whole uh, entity with the bridge and the library and the addition make it this holistic one place. And I think the vestibule there, which you'll be asked to look at, is important as well and, and something that um, I'd hope you consider. So um, the Aurora Public Library Board at our board meeting last week um, approved this report, which you see in front of you, uh, and, and they approved uh, 1.9 uh, and change a million dollars for this project coming from our development charges reserve fund. Um, we think it's important for us. I just explained some of the reasons why it's important for us. I think there's a lot of reasons why it's important for Library Square to be successful. I think it's a legacy, one of the legacies that this, uh, that this council will be able to leave behind. Um, and we wanna make sure you know that the Aurora Public Library is um, invested in this in many ways, including uh, financially too. So I thank you very much for your time and, um, and please consider the decision that you're making tonight. Uh, carefully with thought of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. May I have a motion to receive? Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Kim. Uh, any questions? Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, really no questions, just a comment that we had the opportunity to review this on our uh, meeting last Wednesday. And I just want to thank you, Bruce, for being here tonight. Some of our library members and staff that are in the uh, Ultra Center that are here tonight uh, to support. I just, I really like you, um, able to see this being a very cohesive uh, addition to the overall design. And uh, it, it's one of those things that, you know, the second we were presented with it and see the actual connectivity, it just makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And it's such a great opportunity that, like you said, it, during the construction phase would be great, great to do it at this time. So. Thank you very much for bringing it forward and presenting it again here tonight. And I'm looking forward to our discussion later this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Humphreys. No further questions. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. Our second delegation tonight is uh, Sina uh, Danielle, a resident regarding stable neighborhood study. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, if not, Please state your name, and uh, just to remind you, you have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Or, yep. Okay, hi, um, my name is Sina Daniel, and I live at 48 Royal Road. To give you some background, I, for one, am not one to get involved in the politics of Aurora, but upon closely reviewing this study, I was shocked and had to step forward. I'm just going to read from a letter that I sent the, all the councillors and Mayor Maracas. Um, I am here to speak about the stable neighborhood study and how it negatively impacts the value of our homes in our section of Rural Road. 
We live in a unique pocket of Aurora. Our section of Royal, Royal Road, east of Camden Avenue, contains approximately 19 homes, all of which have 70, 80, 90, and 100 foot lot frontages. They all either have single or double car gar attached garages, and in some cases, side loaded garages. We already have two story bungalow and raised bungalow designs. How can any reasonable person compare homes with these frontages and char characteristics to homes in Regency Acres that have only half the lot frontages and in many cases only carports, not to mention are worth half the value? Including this section as part of your neighbor, na stable neighborhood study was clearly an oversight and a mistake from the start. The proposed bylaw changes should not and cannot apply to this unique portion of Royal. It is unreasonable and unwarranted to have the same bylaws and, and size restrictions apply. There has not been any construction issues from any residents in our section, and because of the large lot frontages, elevation massing and coverage is not an issue as it relates to neighboring properties. Furthermore, we are currently entitled to three car garages and we can currently build reasonably sized bungalows, which is a right that is unjustifiably and, un and unnecessarily being taken away from us. Homeowners invested in these larger properties and purchased on the basis of the current bylaws and the proposed bylaw changes would have the most severe negative financial impact on this section of properties far beyond any other homes in the study. A one-size-fits-all solution is a mistake for this section of Royal that has always been upscale with the largest frontages. The proposed change is discriminatory. Elderly residents and residents with mobility issues will be forced into a two-story as the proposed change does not allow for a sizable bungalow to be built. The current bylaws that are in place for our section of Royal are reasonable and do not require any change. Please delete our unique upscale section of Royal from the stable neighborhood study as it clearly does not have an issue and will not have the same massing issues as the other neighborhoods identified in the study. It does not have the same characteristics. There has not been any construction issues in our section and there will not be any massing issues because of the size of the lawn, la, la, large lot frontages. Upon your careful and detailed review of this section of Royal, we would hope that you come to the same reasonable conclusion that this sh section should and will be deleted from the study for the reasons that I have stated. Um, I just want to add that I have had the privilege to speak to a lot of my neighbors, which I have met because of this issue, and there are many people that do have mobility issues unfortunately, so there is a need for bungalows. And realistically, the footprint that is in place is not sufficient for a bungalow on a, 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 a lot of that size. Um, and also, I just wanted to add um, that I have spoken to many neighbors and am in the process of ha having a petition signed. Majority have signed, I am still working on a few um, that support this issue and believe the same things I do. Um, we believe that it's just a reasonable request and that a reasonable person would agree. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. If you just thank stayed you. there for a second. Oh, sure. May I have a motion to receive? Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Gallo. Uh, any questions or comments for the presenter? Seeing none, thank you so much for coming out tonight. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, next up is our consent agenda. We just have the one item on the agenda, uh, which is the memorandum from Mayor Maracas. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda item C1? Councillor Gardner, Councillor Kim. All those in favor? Carried. On to the advisory committee meeting minutes. First up is the uh, minutes from the financial advisory committee meeting minutes. Can I get a motion to receive? Oh, actually, can I, if no one has any questions, I'll just put them both together. A motion to receive both the, the financial as well as the community, A1 and A2. Councillor Gilliland, Councillor Humphreys. Seeing no questions, all in favor? 
All in favor? Thank you. Everybody's in a hurry to see the wraps tonight, I think. <laughs> On to the regular agenda. Uh, first up is item R1. Yeah. Mayor Marcus? I was just going to ask, um, this is probably going to be a longer discussion, um, and I was just wondering if we could move R2 forward, because I think that would be very quick. We can get the presentation by Chief Planner from the, from the region and just get that over with before we get into the library square, because I, I got a feeling that's going to be a, a pretty long discussion. If, if that's up to everyone, though, I'll just throw it out there. It's, it's, it's up to the will of council. Uh, Mayor Maracas is uh, asking that we move item R2 forward. Can I get a seconder? Councilor Kim? Any questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor of moving R2 forward? Okay. You're welcome. So first up, we will have a presentation from the region. Um, can I assume you're Paul Freeman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, yes I am. <laughs> Please state um, your name and um, is this going to be five minutes? I think it'll be a little longer than that, about 15, 10, so 15. 10, 15, 10 minutes? Sounds okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of committee. Um, my name is Paul Freeman. I'm the Chief Planner at York Region, and I'm pleased to be here this evening to provide you with an update on the region's municipal comprehensive review. Uh, I'll get into the details of what a municipal comprehensive review is in a minute. Uh, that'll be the bulk of my presentation, and I'll spend a bit of time at the end talking about consultation and engagement with our communities. Um, a comprehensive review uh, is a provincial term, and what it essentially means is a review of our official plan that you may be familiar with, a land use planning document. Uh, the region has a 2010 regional official plan, and our local municipalities, all nine of our local municipalities in York, also have uh, official plans. When we undertake a municipal comprehensive review, we include a number of other elements, including a transportation master plan, a water waste water master plan, and uh, a fiscal impact analysis to align growth with infrastructure. Before I get into the uh, details of the comprehensive review, I think it's important to talk a bit about the context for growth in the region, and I think that, uh, as you're well aware, growth is a defining quality about York Region. Over the last three decades, York Region's population has more than doubled, growing by over half a million people. In the next 30 years, the Provincial Growth Plan calls for the region to grow by about 600,000 people and 300,000 jobs. This is the largest growth increment of any regional municipality in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. It's important as we plan for that growth to be comprehensive and to be responsible and to plan for growth in a sustainable manner. Overall, York Region will accommodate future growth through our planned urban structure. And I've got a series of maps that I'll just walk you through very quickly to set that context. Uh, first, starting with uh, the green areas that you can see on this map, which are areas in York Region that are protected through provincial plans, including the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan and the Greenbelt Plan. These lands are off limits to significant development and cover about 58% of York Region. We also have what's called a built boundary and those dark pink areas are the existing urban areas in the region and that is where intensification is planned under the growth plan to occur and you may recall quite a bit of discussion in the last year or so about intensification rates under the growth plan and the intensification rate under the latest version of the growth plan, which is now in effect through Amendment 1, is 50% intensification for York Region. We also have what's called a designated greenfield area in the region, and these are areas that are already designated to accommodate urban development, uh, but not yet built. This is where the designated greenfield area density target of the, gr of the growth plan which calls for 50 people and jobs per hectare is anticipated to be accommodated. 
Our urban structure is quite defined in York Region, and as you can see by the red lines on this map, we have identified quite some time ago what we call centers and corridors. These are uh, corridors of Young Street and Highway 7 that link our four urban growth centers of Newmarket, Richmond Hill Langstaff, and Vaughan Metropolitan Center and the Markham Center. Those are growth centers that are designated in the, green, in the growth plan and are anticipated to accommodate the highest share of densities in York Region. In planning for growth and undertaking a municipal comprehensive review, as you can imagine, there are a number of areas to look at and we have developed a series of uh, topics for background discussions and, discu and uh, key direction reports. And I'm gonna walk you through very quickly some of the, the highlights of where we are in the process on some of these key strategies. The first is planning for intensification. And as I mentioned, the growth plan identifies a target for the entire region. Uh, the growth plan does have strong policy directions for intensification and establishes minimum density targets for key growth areas within our urban uh, areas of the municipality. The region works with our local partners to establish targets based on the regional structure, our infrastructure investments, and planning for what are called major transit station areas, strategic growth areas, and urban growth centers, which I mentioned the four in the region. I'll talk a little bit about uh, our strategy and where we are with the minimum targets, but uh, for example, it really depends on the mode of transit that is being planned. So subway stations are required under the growth plan to have 200 people and jobs per hectare at a minimum. Bus rapid transit, so that's the Viva system that will run along Young Street and Highway 7, and uh, light rapid transit stops and stations are required to have 160 people and jobs per hectare, and GO stations, 150 people and jobs per hectare. I think the key message is that we don't just plan by numbers. We look at the context of all of our areas and it is important to understand what the right look and feel is while we undertake our conformity exercise for the province through our municipal comprehensive review. And I'll come back to that in a minute. For our major transit station areas in York Region, we have 70 major transit station areas that are across all of our municipalities, uh, except Georgina, which does not have any. Um, 57 of these are required in accordance with the growth plan, so that means the schedule in the growth plan identifies areas where uh, major transit station areas have been identified based on priority transit corridors. We've also identified 13 additional potential major transit station areas, and they're noted by the triangles as opposed to the circles that are on the map. There are nine corridors in York Region, which include major transit station areas, the bus rapid transit corridors, which are the blue markers, the GO commuter rail lines, which are in green, and existing and future subway lines that are shown in yellow. So the Spadina ex expansion, extension that extended into the Vaughan Metropolitan Center and the future Young Street extension into Richmond Hill. The additional MTSAs or major transit station areas were identified in consultation with our local municipal staff uh, and their location uh, on, in the regional structure and also the potential for future development. I'll zoom in a little bit closer to Aurora and I do understand that you have a staff report on your agenda that uh, does have some mapping and what this map shows is uh, the very early stages of identifying a major transit station area around the Aurora GO station. I believe that your staff report also identifies a portion of Young Street as a strategic growth area. Uh, this is essentially reflecting the Aurora Promenade secondary plan that you have already adopted as part of your official plan. As I said earlier, the, the numbers and planning for the right context is very important. And what we are working on is developing a um, visualization exercise to understand what 150 or 160 people in jobs per hectare actually looks like on the ground, because it does make a difference. 
And I don't have the images to show you yet, but we will be working with your staff to look at the densities that are existing in Aurora, in other municipalities. You can see some very tall buildings on of this slide. That is in the Vaughan Metropolitan Center. Those are urban growth centers and not anticipated to delineate something that might happen in Aurora. The, every municipality, they're all different. Even along Young Street or Highway 7, the context is different no matter where you are, and it's appropriate and important that we plan at the right scale for those areas. I want to talk for a moment about planning for employment, and I believe your staff report also identifies uh, some information about employment conversions. The uh, growth plan did make a change that employment conversions are only considered through a regional municipal comprehensive review. We have uh, a number of conversions that are in the region. We have 50. 5-0 conversion requests across the region to date, and six or seven are located, I think it's six, uh, are located in uh, Aurora. The region is now required to plan for employment areas and delineate them in the regional official plan. That's a change to what the uh, current growth plan required. They are now located in a local municipal official plan, but they now have to be delineated and designated in a regional official plan. Uh, quickly on housing, that is another key area of the Municipal Comprehensive Review and the need to plan for a mix and range of housing types in our communities. This includes establishing targets for affordable ownership and rental housing and uh, planning for all of our uh, communities and the f residents that Just make One second, Mr. Freeman. Thank Can you. I get a motion to extend? Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Gilliland, all in favour? Thank you. Please continue. Thank you very much. Another key uh, component of the Municipal Comprehensive Review is updating our population and employment forecast. So the growth plan provides a 2041 forecast for both population and employment assigned to each regional municipality. We then allocate that within the region to our, our nine local municipalities, um, taking into account the potential for uh, development, whether it's intensification or existing greenfield area development. The um, growth plan also has a number of other areas and just to highlight them on this screen, uh, climate change is an underlying theme in all of the provincial plans. The regional official plan is now required to include climate change policies that uh, look at mitigation and adaptation and working towards uh, more low carbon communities. The region is undertaking a climate change action plan and details of that will be coming out uh, later uh, next year. The region is also engaged in some other components of the Municipal Comprehensive Review including mapping uh, and policy framework of our agricultural and natural heritage systems across the region and uh, this, these are important um, aspects of our planning for the future. Quickly, I just want to talk about infrastructure coordination and I think that as I mentioned at the outset, as we plan for growth, it's very important to uh, have the infrastructure in place to accommodate that growth and making sure that infrastructure is aligned with when the growth occurs as it happens. Uh, we are undertaking a review of our transportation master plan, our water wastewater master plan, and also looking at the fiscal impact. And we will have uh, more information that will be reported to regional council later this year and next year. And we'll be working with your staff as we provide those updates uh, to council. The final segment <coughs> is uh, undertaking a review of the policy areas of the official plan and uh, working to uh, put that in place with the mapping, the delineation, and infrastructure plans. It's a fairly tight timeline that I just want to highlight on this slide. 2019 is essentially a series of background reports which we have been bringing forward to Regional Council. 20, end of, at the end of 2019 and into 2020, there will be a number of key direction reports, and our goal is to have a, a draft Regional Official Plan update in Q2 of 2020 and regional adoption by the end of next year. I just want to take a moment to highlight uh, some activities around consultation and engagement. 
As many of you know, uh, consultation is a key aspect of updating land use plans uh, in our municipalities, and this is well underway, including consulting with uh, members of the public, with our councils and committees, local partners, indigenous communities, and businesses to guide our work. More specifically, we are collaborating with our local municipal partners through uh, regular uh, workshops and uh, a working group that includes your staff as well as the staff from other uh, local municipalities in York. We meet regularly. We talk about all of the content that is coming forward as part of the Municipal Comprehensive Review. Uh, we are seeking feedback from local municipal councils and committees and uh, looking forward to working together as we move forward. Engagement is always important to draw out and uh, make sure that we are engaging our, our residents as we plan for the future. Uh, we're trying a number of new ways to engage social media, uh, contests, photo contests, and I'll just highlight next week, a week tonight, we are having a walking tour. We've been scheduling a series of walking tours to uh, get the public out, get uh, stakeholders out, and uh, walk our communities with members of staff, whether it's regional staff and also uh, local staff. And I know that your staff will be out next week with us as we uh, undertake a walk in Aurora. We've had uh, walks in two of our urban growth centers, uh, and Aurora is the next uh, walk that we're scheduled, as well as some of our other uh, locations later in the spring. Um, so, Mr. Chairman uh, and committee, I just that's really what I wanted to highlight. Um, we are in early stages, relatively, in our uh, municipal comprehensive review, and as you can imagine, with all of the various um, changes in provincial policy that have been coming out, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster in understanding not only the targets for our growth, but also uh, the amendments and uh, how that affects our work. But uh, we are on track to complete our, our Municipal Comprehensive Review next week, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Can I get a motion to receive the presentation? Councillor Gilliland, Mayor Maracas. Um, questions just to the presenter. We'll hold off on the report. Mayor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, Mr. Freeman, thank you very much for coming. I believe I asked you this at Regional Council, but I'll ask you here since we are in Aurora. Will municipalities such as Aurora be able to maintain their height restrictions uh, and still meet the targets within the, uh, the growth plan and the Amendment 1? Mm -hmm. So uh, first and foremost, the growth plan target applies region-wide. So that 50% intensification is across the entire region. And uh, as of last year, I think our target in the region last year was was 59%. So when you look at all of the urban growth areas in the southern part of the region and you look at other municipalities, we are meeting our growth target uh, at 60%, which is what Amendment 1 proposed in the first place. Now it's back to 50%. Um, every municipality and even within each municipality, the context, as I said, are, are very different. And I think uh, it's, I can't emphasize enough the need to, uh, yes, promote transit supportive densities where it makes sense, and where we have subways, where we have our bus rapid transit, but I think that um, it has to be at the right scale that is uh, established through a process, a community process, like we all go through to, to update our official plan. So I know we haven't run, re ran the numbers yet. We have some very preliminary uh, lines on a map that show a major transit station area. I know your staff report identifies the strategic growth area. Right now, we've just essentially assumed the Aurora Promenade, and we're looking to understand the, the minimum density requirements in the growth plan. But there is also an opportunity uh, and a process to ask the province for alter alternate targets where that makes sense. So again, that visualizing of density, what it looks like, what should it look like, what do our communities want it to look like, and then where those numbers come out. I, I'm more in line to um, look at the look and feel and, and the community planning aspect of it and then see where the numbers come out. And if we need to, we can ask for an alternate target. But uh, I know that I'm not sure if your staff have completely run the numbers. I know they're working quite closely with my staff to run that, but uh, I don't think we'll have a problem with communities l maintaining that height or look and feel that they desire. 
thank you and through you, Mr. Chair, just a comment. I won't put you on the spot, but I, I, from what I'm hearing is, is that each municipality should have the authority to decide how they want to grow instead of the province kind of mm -hmm. overruling us every time. But mm -hmm. we'll save that for another day. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, Councilor Gardner. Thank the you. Uh, I guess following on that, uh, there, there are seven applications according to our report. So um, you did say in your presentation that the region wants affordable and rental housing, and the region has wanted affordable and rental housing for many, many years, and we haven't been that successful in getting it. We're still very low. So um, these seven applications, will the region be looking at those applications to see if they cover that mandate? So through you, Mr. Chairman, these are six or seven. I know our, your report says seven. I think our, my presentation had six. I think one of them did go away. They, they withdrew <laughs> one of the conversion requests. But just to be clear, Mr. Chairman, these are requests for conversion of employment lands. Right. So a conversion would be to a non-employment use. It may or may not be to residential. Um, they're all different. Um, but your question, I think, is would the region be looking, if those conversion requests were successful, would the region be looking for rental or more affordable housing for that? Uh, no, I'm asking if to be successful, do they have to include some rental or affordable housing? Would that be a criteria upon which the region makes a decision? It is not part of the criteria, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've identified uh, in a report that went to Regional Council, and I believe it's referenced in your staff report by your staff, um, conversion criteria that is based on the employment conversion criteria in the growth plan, but looking at it a little more specifically in York Region, uh, given the context of what might be around those employment conversion requests. Uh, affordable housing is uh, under our housing portion yes. of the Municipal Comprehensive Review, a key area to look at. Um, and this is probably another presentation, Mr. Chairman, but the region has been working on a, a, a rental housing incentive program that encourages rental, purpose-built rental. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to give you more information about that uh, offline, Councillor. Thank you. I just mentioned it because you mentioned it in your report. I, I thought it was in the context of the conversions. Okay. Um, Again, so I, to the presentation, you'll have a chance to answer those questions right. from the report to Mr. Waters. I was addressing what was presented in. Um, well, I have to be very careful. I'll try it. So uh, you're taking our, are the conversions are requesting to take our employment land, which um, speaks to our economic viability as a community. So it, um, is Aurora going to have a, is it Aurora who has the final say whether these applications are acceptable or not? So Mr. through you, Mr. Chairman, um, these are requests from landowners. This isn't the region proposing the conversions, just to be clear. Right. Uh, these are requests that we have received, and again, there are, um, 50 across the region. Uh, we have identified, as I said, conversion criteria to evaluate all of these requests. Uh, we will be uh, working with your staff to evaluate that further. I think that there is a need for input from uh, your council and our other local municipal councils for the conversions that apply within those municipalities. Um, the way the growth plan has been uh, amended, the responsibility for delineating and designating employment land is now at the regional official plan level. So ultimately, we will be making recommendations to regional council uh, based on consultation as well as input from, uh, from uh, yourselves as our council and from our other local councils as well. Thank you. I'll try one more time as well. Um, thank you. When the region is looking at these applications, are they taking into consideration the new floodplain mapping that the Conservation Authority is putting forward? Uh, we would look certainly look at that. We would look at a number of um, criteria and constraints as they may apply. These are existing employment lands, so um, whether they're, I would assume they're not in the floodplain, but it uh, depends on the level of detail that exists on each parcel. Councilor Thank Garner. you. Thank you. 
Councillor Gilliland, again to the presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick comment saying thank you so much for this presentation and just for um, the public and I want to confirm that it's actually uh, a walk and talk next Tuesday, May 28th at 5.30 p.m. at the Aurora Public Library? Correct. And will you be attending? I will. All right, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gallo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two questions. Um, what would what will be the process that um, the region will be taking uh, in terms of influencing where these higher density areas would would end up um, in terms of a public? I saw some 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 of your slides, but even in terms of our council, mm -hmm. at what point will we be weighing in on on where we feel those densities should be? So through you, Mr. Chairman, there are a number of steps and stages, and it's not just intensification or housing, but employment of um, climate change. There's a, there are a number of uh, background studies, as I've mentioned, that we're looking for input. And uh, on intensification, we are, uh, we've released a draft report through to Regional Council that delineates all of the 70 major transit station areas. Uh, most of our municipalities, in fact, I think all of our local municipalities are bringing forward reports to local councils, like the one you have uh, on your agenda tonight that delineates uh, the major transit station area and a strategic growth area. Uh, we're looking for input at this stage. Uh, we're looking for input when we report back uh, and before we report back to regional council later this year. Uh, we're looking for engaging the public, uh, such as the, the walk and talk with the chief planner. We're trying to engage as many people as we can. In a number of cases, uh, existing official plans already delineate a, a number of the major transit station areas, whether they're called the Aurora Promenade or whether they're called a uh, key development area. In many cases, our municipalities are well underway to achieving and planning for intensification. I'm not. Um, I don't believe that the numbers necessarily have to increase that much. And, and as uh, Mayor Maracas asked, you know, is a municipality entitled to maintain the heights and densities that they're looking for? And I do believe that, you know, the, the relationship between the regional official plan and delineating and setting these areas, and then the local official plans to further delineate height and density, I think that that is something that we will be working together with your staff on to uh, help delineate the areas and report through to, uh, to council and ultimately for me to report back to regional council on all of these 70 major transit station areas and, and whether they are going to all achieve the intensification target the province has identified or in fact uh, what alternative targets should we be asking for as part of our process to the province. Thank you. Is it fair to say that um, one of the reasons we intensify around public transportation corridors is to avoid um, urban sprawl and, and um, particularly, in, at least in Aurora, that uh, around the GO train that it's, it's the movement is towards a higher density uh, around public transportation corridors. Through you, Mr. Chairman, it is. And uh, that's why the, the growth plan identifies higher targets depending on the mode of transit. So subways are higher than a bus rapid transit, which is higher than a GO station, which is higher than a local bus. So absolutely, you're quite right. The, the goal is to uh, encourage transit use, um, to uh, put intensity and, and uh, higher density, not only residential, but even employment and mix of uses near transit supportive densities or in transit supportive locations. Um, so all of that, are, those are all part of the goals. I should mention also that the, the province has given a guideline of the boundary of a major transit station area and usually it, it has to do with walkability. So a 500 to 800 meter distance from a transit station is essentially a, a walkable distance to transit. So those are all, um, goals of encouraging intensification in proximity to transit. Thank you, very informative, and I look forward to providing input. Thank you, thank you very much for the presentation. Council, we need a mover and a seconder to put the item on the floor.
Councillor Gallo, Councillor Kim. Would anybody care to speak to R2? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Councillor Gallo. This is the report? Yes. Uh, just a, a, a quick question to staff on page, um, page four of the report uh, near the bottom. It, uh, second last paragraph York Region has requested town staff to provide preliminary um, recommendations on each request referring to two and three key uh, cr uh, criteria um, that provide the rationale and I'm, I'm wondering whether or not we've been doing that or we're doing that or, and if we are whether or not council will be in the loop in terms of what that um, what the recommendations that staff are providing if that will, it will be coming to Council. Mr. Waters? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, we have been uh, assessing the, um, the conversions. Uh, we've been holding off because the May 1st deadline did provide for a couple more to come in. Um, so we are now look, sorry. We are now reviewing those and we hope to provide a response, a uh, plenary response to the region by the end of the month or in early June. Uh, we will definitely come back to you once um, the full criteria has been assessed and analyzed by the region, so we can report on that uh, to you. I'm hoping that'll be in the fall sometime. Councilor Gallo. So just, just to clarify, the, the recommendations will be coming from staff to region and then back to, to us, so we won't have any input on, on those recommendations. Through you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Waters. Through you, Mr. Chairman, at this time, the region has asked the town to analyze two or three of the criteria, so not the full range of criteria. Once we have uh, the ability to uh, review what the region has provided staff uh, regarding all of the criteria, we will then report on that um, as our uh, as our comment to the region. You'll be uh, you'll be provided that uh, that input sometime in the fall. Do, do we, sir, through you, Mr. Chair, do, do we have a sense already of the criteria that we will be basing these recommendations on? And is Council aware of that criteria? Mr. Waters, can you speak to the criteria? Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I recall um, that the criteria had was shared with, uh, with staff and or with the town rather in a previous report. Um, but as part of this report, we have included as an appendix uh, to the report, so you're aware of the criteria which includes this criteria that's, I believe it's um, attachment one. Um, it includes criteria that the region has added in addition to what the growth plan is requiring for, uh, for uh, assessment on con employment conversions. Councillor Gallo. Okay, thank you. Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm on page seven. At the bottom, um, cursory build-out scenario based on draft targets. So what we have now for the 2006 to 2031, 2031 horizon is a target of 4,120 people and 3,140 units. That's going to go up to 7,750 people, but only an ex not even an extra thousand units. So, how are these going to be much? S I don't see how that works. There's there's um, for to go from 4,120 to 7,750 people, and yet only increase the number of units by a third? Mr. Waters. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, let me try to explain this um, uh, in a simplistic way. Um, the numbers that you have on, in Chapter 2 are for 2031. Um, right. There likely will be an increase uh, over the 10-year period to 2041 right. um, for, um, for the town. And that will likely come through uh, the promenade area in terms of the MTSA and the SGA. Uh, we have not sort of finalized those numbers. Um, the um, the, the 7750, um, I believe, is for the promenade. Um, 
So that's something that we need to sort of confirm with the region. It doesn't assume full redevelopment of, of the promenade. It, uh, my understanding, it assumes uh, about 50% of the promenade being redeveloped. Thank yes, you. May, I think maybe I didn't ask the right question. We're on page on page seven. We're we're almost doubling the number of people, but we're only increasing the units by about a third. So I I'm trying to figure out in my mind what that means. Does that mean we're going to have bigger units to accommodate so many more people? Okay, so I've lost every. Did I lose you too? Perhaps, perhaps, Councillor Gardner, uh, Mr. Waters can uh, okay. look into it for you. Offline, and come back next week. we can do it <laughs> next week. Mr. Waters, we'll speak afterwards. Anything further? No. Councillor Humphreys. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of my questions was answered. Just a quick one to, uh, through to Mr. Waters. Um, with the seven um, requests for conversion of summer employment lands, um, just in terms of the process, will the region will provide feedback? And was there a time frame when the region gets back to us? And how does that does it come back to our table here to make final decisions? Uh, Mr. Waters, earlier you spoke about it coming back in the fall. Are there further steps after it comes back in the fall? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. So at the, I'll, I'll, I'll sure. restate I'll the fact that the region has asked the town at this time to look at two or three of the criteria right. and then advise them on a, on a preliminary basis what our feedback is. Um, we will report back to you once we have the full set of criteria evaluated before we respond to the region. And I hope that will be in the fall sometime. Okay. Thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And the only reason I'm asking is I've never remembered anything like this and just the, the employment lands are so important to us. I just want to make sure that we have a lot of have influence on what happens, you know, in the future is just thanks. Thank you. Councillor Kim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three to uh, Mr. Waters. Uh, so the, you know, SGA and the MTSA was largely drafted, you know, not from any uh, detailed technical analysis. It's just really uh, a product of our promenade plan. Uh, can you confirm when in the future, if we decided we wanted a change in the, in the boundaries in the MTSA, when we would have that opportunity? Mr. Waters? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, one of the um, comments we'll come back to you with is whether the promenade, so whether the boundaries of the MTSA and the SGA are appropriate. At this time, they have followed um, the boundaries of the existing promenade secondary plan. There may be some adjustments required uh, to those boundaries to include properties that are not currently there, um, or there may be uh, recommendations to exclude the boundary or, or adjust the boundaries to exclude properties. So until we've had that thorough analysis in-house, we are we are not ready to report on the boundaries in terms of any adjustments. We'll just take what has been developed to this date and review it. Thank you. Councillor Kim? Thank you. Councillor Gardner for the second time. Um, c could you refer to page 19? And my question is about the buffer zones. And in particular, the Aurora Promenade area, because it's there's a lot of residential in that area and we're t thinking uh, of proposed MTAs are just to the east of the, um, I guess the Town Park area and the Williams area. So what does it mean exactly, a 500 meter buffer zone and an 800 meter buffer zone? Mr. Waters. Through you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, the 500 and 800 meter uh, zones uh, essentially represent walking time or walking distance. Oh. So um, to reasonably walk within a um, 10 minute uh, time period, it's about 500. 800 is approximately 20 minutes, and that's probably a pretty brisk walk at the end of the day, but um, those are typically what's used when planning MTSAs. Right. Councilor Carter. And it was referred to that that's 500, 800 meters is a walkable, considered walkable to transit. Is that what you're referring to? Mr. Waters. That's correct. Um, well, then I'm confused because it's called a, a buffer zone. I thought that was to protect 
the residents in the area. Usually buffer zones are protective. Mr. Waters. Speaking you, Mr. Chairman, um, it's probably, I, I wouldn't call that a buffer zone, um, but um, uh, I've, I, it's been referred to other, um, other, uh, other uses, but uh, buffer, it, it's not intended to be a buffer in terms of buffering land uses. Thank you. So we could instead call it a, 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 a walkable zone or a walkable distance. I, buffer is very misleading to me. Mr. Waters. We can uh, review the terminology and, and I believe Metrolinx did introduce uh, some MTSA planning guidelines. We can refer to those and get the proper uh, terminology. Thank, Thank you. you. Mayor Maracas, did you want to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to bring up the fact that I, I hope everyone takes the time to read the actual conversions that are being requested. Um, if you go through it on page four, you'll notice that that three of the seven conversion requests um, are basically within the Magna Employment Lands area. So it's it's not necessarily six or seven individual ones three of them are specifically in that area so I hope everyone takes the time to read it and and from what I'm reading only one of them is specifically to transferring directly to residential so thank you very much seeing no further questions all those in favor of receiving for information carried next up we'll go back to R1 can I have someone put the item on the floor there's a pre oh sorry my apologies another presentation Ms. McDougall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just take a brief moment to uh, just get the framework of this presentation uh, and introduce the presenters for council. Um, so just to highlight quickly, and certainly for those uh, watching and listening, the uh, uh, report before council here is a continuation of the Library Square project. It's as a result of the March 21st report when council endorsed the project to move forward. Um, through that discussion, count staff were also directed at that time to come back with design options for the linkage between the library and the cultural center, the cultural center edition. Um, although not formally directed, um, there was some conversation regarding a cafe or restaurant concession opportunity, um, and staff had um, communicated at the time in March that the consultants had identified some options that could be um, further evaluated. So the, that item too is before council uh, for consideration. And then in addition, when the linkage was being considered and the connectivity between the two facilities, other, a couple of other amenities came forward and that's also highlighted in the report being the ex library extension corridor and also the library entrance vestibule. There is an attached um, package to the report. Tonight the presentation has a few additional slides. Um, as we know that designing work is con continuous so they have a few extra highlights to share with council today in this presentation following tonight's um, presentation and council meeting will be able to be posted on our website for the public to, con to view although the uh, report and the attachment of the report is almost 100 percent there just a few extra slides uh, being added the importance of tonight's discussion uh, and the timeliness of tonight coming back is the consultants are working hard at uh, proceeding with the detailed design process and to stay on track of, uh, best we can. Our goal is to come back to council in July to obtain further direction to move forward to construction design documentation. And therefore, it's important to get an understanding from council today, your interest in the linkage and the cafe as they need to be determined or included in the designing of this facility. So that is the critical piece of timeliness coming today and hoping uh, council between today and next week, uh, council can make some decisions to include these amenities or at least include for future consideration so that the design work can be done today to at least incorporate the footprints of those pieces. So leaving it at that, as a quick intro, um, I would like to introduce our consultants today uh, with us today from Raw Design, our architects. We have a couple of familiar faces and a new one as well. We have uh, Thomas Nemascari, Roland Rum Kolhoff, and Aaron Hendershot. And I'm not sure which order they're going to go in, but I'll ask them to come forward, please. If I could just get you to state your name when you're uh, presenting so we can follow along. Good evening, Council. My name is Thomas Nemascari. I'm uh, here on behalf of Raw Design. 
with my colleague Aaron Hendershot. I'm going to take a quick couple of minutes to review the. Um, did this one? Just go ahead. Is this one? Yeah. Um, to review the cafe design options that we had been exploring over the last couple of months, and um, the first. The first instance of the cafe design is uh, that which is built within the current building design. It is uh, is proposed to occupy a, a space that we had labeled as a multi-purpose cafe area. And uh, upon direction from council, we um, proceeded to begin integrating equipment, including refrigeration equipment, uh, a dishwasher, um, display cabinets, and the necessary counter space to um, present and prepare food. Um, so in, in this slide here, you can see um, the outline of, of that. Uh, we had also explored for the town uh, an option which um, considered a kitchen being added to this cafe area uh, upon um, input from Niagara College, which was um, approached at the time. Um, in, in this slide you can see two areas that are um, proposed to, uh, to provide kitchen area for the, uh, the cafe, the, the front of house. Um, in, in both instances the washrooms and office areas would be relocated to occupy a portion of the program room. on to this slide. So th this is just an elevation of the proposed cafe design, again in the current configuration. Um, in keeping with the overall materiality of, of the building, we um, introduced uh, countertops that um, were sympathetic to the, uh, the uh, sort of Nordic influence. Uh, we did propose to repurpose some of the glue lamb timber uh, as uh, some of the counter space as well as um, the use of stone for um, the larger feature counter space. Um, this layout occupies uh, or is proposed to uh, serve about 30 to 35 patrons. Again uh, another view into the proposed cafeteria area which would open out onto the um, onto the plaza. In this slide, a, a view of the um, proposed materials, uh, just pointing to the reclaimed timber, the um, white stone counter, and the wood furniture, again, sympathetic with the overall building aesthetic. The next slide is a, uh, a, consider a reconsideration of the cafe area um, if, the, if either bridge option, is, uh, wh which Aaron will present to you, is, is uh, implemented. So, in this layout, where the the bridge um, terminates at the second level, um, we propose to continue the um, the stairwell that uh, exists just above this floor level down to this level, and um, bring the public into this um, this this more public space at the plaza level, uh, and and have them circulate through the building. Um, through that stairwell. So we've re reoriented the cafe in this instance and provided a bit more glazing onto the plaza to, uh, to serve that purpose. And here's a view into that cafe area, again with the stairwell seen just beyond. And uh, in this instance, uh, another bridge design option in which terminates at the plaza level um, with a set of stairs going directly into the cafe area. Again, uh, activating both the plaza, the building, and um, and the library beyond uh, through the use of this this public amenity. Um, I'm going to leave it at that so that Eric can present the um, the bridge options. Hi, thanks, Thomas. Uh, my name is Aaron Hendershot with Raw Design. I'm uh, pleased to present some of our uh, preliminary design work for the Aurora Public Square link, um, and. Uh, Thank you for uh, Bruce for introducing uh, before some of the images and some of the preliminary design concepts, which I'll uh, briefly go through in a little more detail. Um, which one? 
as uh, Thomas mentioned, we've been asked to, um, to look at uh, three options in terms of creating a link between the library and the, um, and the uh, new schoolhouse addition. Uh, two are bridge options, and one is actually uh, a tunnel option under the plaza, which I'll uh, briefly go through. Um, Sorry, Mr. Hendershot, can I just ask you to step closer to the microphone yes. and speak up a little bit? Yes. Thank you. Um, so you can see in this slide, uh, this represents uh, more or less a bridge link at the, which is linking the second level of the library to the second level of the schoolhouse addition. The, um, the, the primary objectives here, as uh, Bruce had mentioned, are to create an indoor passage from the library to the new schoolhouse addition uh, to allow some of the shared programming for people to go back and forth uh, um, in the interior and to allow um, uh, some of the shared programming functions. Um, while creating that link, we also want to maintain at the plaza level a lot of uh, openness of views and, and circulation in the plaza. So that's why it was de decided that this would happen at an upper level to not um, obstruct movement in the square. And, um, and thirdly, what, what we're really interested in here is creating a new type of public space in the square in this bridge so that this, this link is not just seen as a um, place from getting from point A to point B, but creates a new top type of public space that people can go up, they can uh, hang out, they can do work, and look out over the square. Um, for the bridge options, we're imagining um, that the bridge really framed the square by working with some of the existing topography and landscape design. Um, by um, creating this sort of boomerang shape that actually um, frames the square, but also um, provides sort of a, um, a, a bit of an entry condition at the north as well, which we'll see in a later slide. Uh, what we want to do here is to maintain really open uh, ground planes so that um, people can go uh, to and from the plaza, as well as provide somewhat of a, a covered passageway at the plaza level and, um, and uh, links to down to the cafe and to the upper level of the library. Uh, here you can see the bridge uh, at an upper level and some of the uh, spaces that would look out over the square and some of the spaces that would be framed by that plaza. Um, Option A, as I described, um, uh, uh, as Thomas had alluded to earlier, was a link at the second level to the second level of the plaza, which we would introduce um, an extension of a stair that would take someone down into the, uh, the public cafe. It's important that we create a link down to a very public area. Um, and, and then here, as was shown before, is uh, just in the background is where that stair you'd come across into the building and come down this, this generous public stair directly into the cafe. Um, option B looked at introducing a stair right within the bridge that would come down and enter directly into the, at the cafe level to create a little bit more of um, a formal and inviting entrance into the cafe. Um, par part of that work would also involve um, additional um, elements of the plaza design that have yet to be fully incorporated but uh, would involve a storage for um, service equipment like Zambonis for the, um, for the uh, skating rink. Uh, so here you can see on the right where, how that stair would be integrated into this bridge design and come right down. We're also um, and then at, at this level, um, just in the distance where that stair would be coming down into the cafeteria. Um, so this is a view looking uh, south from the drop-off area we see, you know, especially at night. This is a, a well-lit area where there's lots of activity happening, and um, it frames out towards the entrance to, to create almost a, a type of a, a marquee uh, entrance into the plaza to uh, really give a sense of arrival into the plaza. Some of the uh, material palette we're looking to um, derive um, from from the uh, from the from the cultural center building. Uh, same types of material we'd be bringing uh, through and across the bridge 
uh, slate flooring, lots of uh, natural wood ceilings it's to, to create a really uh, warm and inviting space. Um, the th third option here that we were looked at it, we're looking at very conceptually is what a tunnel option would look like and how it would be um, interfacing with the existing library building and the new uh, schoolhouse addition. Um, uh, as part of this work, we've also been exploring uh, other potential supplementary improvements uh, that, that we believe would uh, improve the design and, and the user experience. Um, the, the first op option D indicated here, um, and Bruce spoke to earlier, is, is what it would look like to have a, an extension of this link to come right out to Young Street, to give the link presence on Young Street, and then as part of that, um, creating new uh, outdoor spaces like a reading garden that would um, look out directly from the library. And um, this would also give uh, the option of having this, this bridge link directly to the schoolhouse edition uh, in the event um, during times that the library is closed so that people can come. Uh, the cultural center has a presence on Young Street and an entrance that someone could use to, to go across the um, plaza to the space. And then uh, lastly, uh, another improvement that we um, think would, uh, would, would complement the other elements is a, a um, new entrance vestibule on the square to give a little bit more presence to the library, both from the south, so that um, the entrance is legible and visible and um, a new and inviting and accessible entrance that would be um, complementary to the uh, the material palette and uh, the the new look and the feel of the uh, the new schoolhouse addition and the bridge as well. And we would like to see um, these. We think that these improvements complement one another and give a coherent built form to the plaza with the entrance to the library on the left, the link, and then. Uh, the cafe and the cafe reconfiguration that we proposed earlier that would allow um, people using the cafe to sit out in, into the square and um, really frame the square with lots of pedestrian activity, both at the ground and then above on the link. So uh, thank you, uh, ch uh, Chairman Committee, for allowing us to uh, present. We look forward to working with the team to uh, develop this link further. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to receive the uh, presentation. Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Gillen. Any questions to the architects on the presentation itself as opposed to the report? Councillor Gardner. Thank you very much for your work. Um, you did mention a drop-off area drop-off area looking south. So are we talking about the parking lot to the north? Uh, through Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Gardner, yes, the, the, the drop-off area that I um, mentioned earlier uh, is at the south end of the proposed parking lot to the north. So part of that work involves, uh, uh, I guess, a lay-by for drop-offs to the plaza. Thank you. I didn't know we had that. Thank you. Um, the the new library entrance is that what is there now? Nothing. The, is that just outside the covered over area where the bell is? Yes. Thank you. Um, with respect to the green roof, uh, my understanding is that a green roof needs um, because they're heavy. That it needs quite a lot of extra support. So could you speak to that uh, are you th from an engineering point of view? I'm already wondering how we're going to support the, this as is. Is that something I can ask you or is that? Yes, um, again, the, the work is preliminary at this point, but it's, it's our proposal that this bridge would be given a similar treatment to the new uh, cultural center. We have been working uh, with our engineer to um, ensure that the, the design that we have that has the green roof will be um, 
will still give uh, an appearance of lightness and, um, and, and will be structurally sound, obviously, while giving a, um, the, the, the type of uh, sustainable uh, design and aesthetic. That's Thank you. And could you uh, say how wide the bridge is, uh, like the, uh, yes. the width? Um, so um, as you can see in this diagram, um, it does widen to the center. So where we meet the building, uh, the bridge will be about three meters or 10 feet wide um, to allow, um, which we believe is a, a generous width for people going in both directions, widening out to about uh, 18 or more feet in the center uh, to allow some of those additional uh, spaces like seating and um, uh, activities to take place. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gallo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when, when designing the, I'm going to call it food services because I'm not going to call it a cafe just yet. Um, when designing the food services area, did we consult with any uh, potential tenants such as a Starbucks or a Tim Hortons or, or whoever we feel might go into that space? To the and if it's for staff, I'll I come can, back I to can I'll, when we put the report on the floor. You're happy to ask Ms. McDougall again, yeah. but we'll keep it just to the presenters for now. Okay, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I I would refer to Ms. McDougall Ms. Right. McDougall's um, I'll visit ask it after to then. Niagara Thanks. College. Yep. I'll ask it after. Thanks. Any further questions to the presenter, Councillor Gilliland? Thank you, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a really quick question. I um, I do really like the designs that you've brought forward, so thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, just a quick question, and it's just probably just schematics that you notice that you had an option B and you had nice seating that kind of um, uh, fell out into the outdoors onto the patio area there, which I think is brilliant and I love that. Um, but I noticed there was just two tables, and is it just for the sake of the design or is there actually more room to put a little more tables in the two? Uh, in the cafe on option B. So, um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, if I were to go back, option. So you're referring to the two tables outside of the building? Yeah. Correct. Uh, there could be more. Okay, I just want to make sure if that was specific to the size that you could only do that or if the, you could expand. There is a maximum um, patron occupancy within the building of 40, but um, you can have tables outside. I think the question was whether or not the tables can exist, whether it be option A or option B on the outside of the uh, More the than the tables, tables could exist in both options outside of the building. Thank you. Yes. Anything further, Councilor Kelly? No. Nope. Seeing no questions of the presenters, motion to receive. All in favor? Perfect. Would somebody care to put the, uh, the recommendation on the floor? Councilor Humphrey, seconded by Councilor Kim. Uh, with Council's indulgence, I'll go to Ms. McDougall first to answer Councillor Gallo's question with regards to the cafe slash food services. Thank you, uh, through Mr. Chair, uh, to Councillor Gallo. Uh, as far as at this stage to get feedback on um, the functionality of the space, uh, we did consult with Niagara College, who do offer and operate uh, kiosks as well as restaurants in their school's uh, operation. So they're quite familiar with the spaces, the amenities that would be required for the various types, whether it be a full-on kitchen or whether it be a cafe style. Um, so we were confident in at least the amenities that we're proposing would be suitable for an operation. Um, as far as consulting businesses and getting their interest, no, we have not done uh, an expressions of interest at this point. Thank you. Any questions from members of council on the report? Councilor Carter. Thank you very much uh, for the designs. It must be very hard to be a designer and wait to hear what people have to say about it, but it is beautiful. Um, I, the bridge, is there going to be an elevator from the bridge Ms. to anywhere? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the, in both cases, the A and B option, the accessible route to come straight across the bridge into the addition would be to go continue on along the second floor okay. over to the central 
elevator. In the second option, it does provide the additional staircase within the bridge. But in both cases, they both have stairs, it's just where the stairs are um, accommodated. But the accessible elevator route is utilizing the central elevator within the addition. So you'll be able to walk or wheel or whatever across the bridge and Keep get going. into an area where you can take an elevator. Definitely, yes. Um, same for the library? Yes, same for the library. They have their elevator centrally located in the library. And it looked in the designs that you go through the cafe. Well, I guess you go through the second floor, but if you're doing the stairs, you're, you end up in the cafe. So, yes, that's a yes. So that would mean people coming across the bridge would come into the cafe and there might be a lot of traffic in the cafe. Ms. McDougall? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, in fact, um, I wouldn't necessarily see a lot of traffic per se, but I actually think it's a positive because it would put them well, into a place where there is food services as a feature. Um, it lands them in a place where you'd want them to be. Uh, as far as they're accessible to get across the path, whether there's some tables on the side, there's still going to be a, an accessible uh, pedestrian pathway or a route to get beyond the tables into the central corridor. I think uh, it, it could be a positive or it could be a negative if you're trying to have a quiet cup of coffee, it might be a negative to have a lot of, hopefully a lot of traffic coming across the bridge if we do that. Um, could you speak to the drop-off area? We haven't done any kind of a curved area for a drop-off area, have we? Ms. McDougall. Through Mr. Yeah. Chair, um, yes, the um, parking plan um, and the outdoor square design incorporated laybys as a drop-off out front of the library there. Uh, right. Same site and location by the, where. Where the path on the ground was going to go, the bridge is now just above that. The pathway and the lay-by is still present. We haven't changed that footprint. Right, but there's nothing in the in the parking area that we have as a a drop-off area. No, the drop-off is al along the edge of the laneway. Thank you, um, Ms. McDougall. So the drop-off and everything is still the same as previous plans. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the 40 person occupancy is, so that is, I'm sorry, could you explain that? Ms. McDougall? I can, sir, yes, you'd prefer. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I was referring to uh, the occupancy at which um, a staff washroom would have to be introduced. Ah. You're referring to the cafe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Questions, Councilor Gardner? No, thank you. Any other member? Councilor Gallo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a few things. It, um, in various areas in the report, it speaks to a, um, a lack of business case um, to support food operations. Um, and I, I'm I guess my, my opinion hasn't changed in terms of um, have we done enough to determine whether or not a more extensive food operations, a restaurant, um, is a possibility. Um, we, you know, in my mind, as I've expressed before, you know, a, a marketing exercise we have uh, the luxury of having one of the world's greatest cities in terms of restaurants um, within a 40 minute car ride um, to access the Toronto market, take the top 100 restaurants and see whether or not they want a second location in an affluent community in a, what I believe is going to be a really cool space. Um, we haven't done any of that. And um, to, to suggest that there isn't a business case. I, I really, I've read everything. I read the previous reports. And uh, I, I haven't seen anything concrete other than um, at our last meeting, the um, consultants, not these consultants, the previous consultants, um, you know, Ping off a few a few places that don't work well. I think one of them was the Living Arts Center in Mississauga, and and I've been there, and 
it's a fantastic restaurant and, and I beg to differ that it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and for, for me, there's two reasons why I still am doing my best to push as hard as I can for uh, significant food services. And that is, it adds to the dynamics of a plaza, whatever you want to call it. Um, it provides a service as well as it, um, it provides a revenue stream. Um, and to me, that's really important. Um, and we haven't fully, in my view, flushed that out. Um, and I may be alone in this, and, and I probably am if, am if I get the sense from the last meeting and, and um, that you know, it may not be the will of council to move in that direction, but um, I, I, I would ask my fellow colleagues to, at a minimum, um, certainly one of the recommendations or one of the options that staff have not recommended, and I wouldn't recommend either, to, to spend some $450,000 to outfit a, a restaurant that just doesn't make sense to me and it wouldn't, um, I, I'm not even sure uh, how that idea could come about. Um, to carve out a space and to have a restaurant come in and do their own leaseholds um, makes much more and is of, in the norm uh, uh, in the industry um, or at a minimum have significant, if we were to spend that money, have significant um, uh, rental rates that uh, a long-term lease would, would recover those costs. Um, so if, if, if we're moving in any direction, I would still um, encourage everyone to, to explore uh, more options and put some more work into, into the, the possibility of having more food services. Um, if we haven't contacted a Starbucks or a Tim Hortons, uh, if we're moving into more of a cafe style, um, that's probably a pretty good thing to do to understand what it is they need if we're spending money towards outfitting the, the, the space. What, at the end of the day, I would be very, very disappointed uh, if we end up with a cafe similar to our arenas. And, I, and, I, and I'm sitting here and I would be extremely frustrated and disappointed if that's what we end up with. Um, it just isn't, isn't at the level that this needs to be. Um, and, you know, we struggle with finding tenants to be in those spaces. The, and I mean no disrespect to the operators and, and they do their very best. Um, but it just, we're not thinking out of the box if that's what we're going to end up with. And I would be very disappointed if that's what, what it, it, we do end up with. Um, in terms of, um, the financing uh, for this, or at least how we're going to pay for it, it's, it's equally disturbing to me that um, other than the additions that are being um, proposed, there is a, uh, a funding plan for them in, in the report. Uh, but overall, um, it would have been nice to have had those included in, in with the, the um, overall scope of the project and how we're, we're, we're going to be paying for it. I did see a, an email, thanks to Councillor Kim, uh, requesting uh, that, that breakdown. Um, that should be, at some point, a public document. It should be, really, it should have been part of this, this report. Um, but if we, if we look at it, um, if, we, if we move forward with what's before us, and I know I'm over my time and I'm happy to, to I have 10 minutes, oh, wonderful, okay. Um, the library is com committing uh, 1.6 out of DCs previously, uh, and maybe this is a question for, for Mr. Gardner. Um, in our previous report, they were committing 1.6 uh, six million out of DC reserves, and I'm wondering if um, the what's in the current report, the 1.9, is in addition to the 1.6 that was in our previous report. Through you to Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the uh, 1.9 1. 1. million that's in this report, the, it's in addition to the 517 for in the first report. 
Uh, of the 1.6 million you quoted, that was a combination of library DCs as well as parks uh, development DCs. Uh, so the library represented the 517 portion of that, and, and definitely that was considered as part of this this funding option that was explored here. So just to clarify, you're saying that the library DCs would contribute 2.4 million, 500 from the previous report, and 1.9 tonight. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. And and in terms of hydro uh, investment reserve, um, the previous report was um, 3.5 million, and um, this one is 2.2. .2. Um, although the the email that we got um, had a total that would have totaled 5.7, the email that we got today um, had 8.3 million out of the hydro reserve fund through you, Mr. Chair. I'm just not sure how we came up with the the 8.3. Mr. Gardner. The previous report was 3.5. This one's 2.2. Uh, the remainder of the the hydro proceeds noted here. Uh, was previous monies that council had approved as part of the original budget for the square. Uh, about 2.3 million or so was approved prior to all these p other decisions that had been made, which I believe gets you closer to the 8.3. I, I could provide you a more detailed breakdown of the 8. So in the previous report in March, um, Library Square Consolidated Capital Investment Funding Strategy, the total was 3.5 million from the hydro uh, investment reserve we're adding 2.2 .2 now yet in the email it was 8.3 mr gardner perhaps you can recirculate uh, the email to all the council and provide uh, some more details for council gardner uh, gallo's question yeah no problem thank in you in fact i think um mr chair and members of council that it's not only me no no quite I'm frankly the public we should either have a public um, memorandum or something explaining how we're going to pay for this because I sit here as a counselor and I'm still unclear how we're going to pay for this. Agreed. If we remove, if we don't get the community benefit uh, um, grant, which is 14.1, we're at some $22 million out of our reserve, out of our um, hydro reserve, just to be clear. $22 million we're going to be spending on this project out of the hydro reserve if we don't get that $14.1 million. Um, and I just want this nailed down, and I want to feel confident we know where, where, our, where the money's coming from to pay for this project. Um, and I sit here um, pretty deep into this, and I, and I don't have a, a high level of confidence of where and how we're going to pay for this, this project. Um, and it, I need to be convinced if I'm going to be supporting it. Councillor Humphreys. Um, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'm in support of the report in general, and I'm actually looking really forward to having the linkage between the two, um, the library and the cultural center. I think it's going to make a very cohesive um, library square or, or you know plaza um, and I think it's great to do it now uh, rather than wait um, I just wanted to touch on Councillor Gallo's concerns on the cafe concession bar um, I you know through you Mr. Chair is there any way that we can have it uh, a roughed in area um, ready for any type of uh, business venture or opportunity that we can have this um, go out to fruition other than just a cafe snack bar I mean we could start with that but I could see as the um, it evolves we have some uh, great opportunity with some of the things that happen at the cultural center now that there's an opportunity to have like a bit of a restaurant or things for breakout after you know intermission we'll have a drink and I'm not sure if that's possible thinking is that, can we build um, that in? I'm happy to turn over Ms. McDougall. I, I think there are some size constraints between the two different ideas, but I'll let Ms. McDougall expand upon um, whether or not there are flexibility options to either expand, enlarge, or have a rough out. Through Mr. Chair, um, as the architects had shown on, sorry, I'm just trying to help you with a slide, slide three of the presentation. 
that was handed out tonight. So I don't know if you can pull it back up on the screen, Ishida. Slide three. Um, so this slide, a bit hard to see on the screen. Um, this slide, from the architect's perspective, based on the footprint of the facility that we have available to us, obviously that's been already determined and uh, what we're moving forward from a footprint perspective. So therefore we have to work within the building uh, to determine how we can fit um, amenities in. This slide tried to demonstrate um, a kitchen option and this would be the kitchen meeting where food prep would take place, a full kitchen with your proper stoves and venting uh, requirements, um, dishwashers, ovens, um, refrigeration systems that would suit a full kitchen. Seeing on this design here demonstrated that uh, we would have to take over the space that's currently office space and therefore move office space uh, showing on the hatch marks on the screen where it would have to be accommodated or alternatively take over where what is now the washrooms and the washrooms would have to be moved away uh, into the hatch mark areas. Both scenarios um, would take over footprint space of what's now determined to be program room. Um, and which was a, a space for community use, for community, uh, whether it's town use or potential community user groups. That space, uh, the program room space at the moment is flexible. It could be a future opportunity for a restaurant scenario. The risk of moving down the path of roughing in is you'd have to be prepared to rough in not only this space but all the washroom uh, requirements, the upgraded washroom capacities. Um, architects probably can describe a bit better for what some of the other challenges may be. Keeping in mind that uh, the footprint that we have and we're presenting with the cafe scenario, um, to make that functional, and this is something that maybe I'd ask Thomas or Aaron to come forward back to the podium if you don't mind. The cafe scenario turning sideways, um, so it would be sitting in front of the office space, which was presented on the, one of the later slides due to the impact of the bridge. Would it be possible as a future scenario, being that they would back onto office space, if the office space, knowing the cafe, if it was to be structured out front, if there did prove to be an operation that could function as a restaurant at this site, could the office space, knowing it's backing onto plumbing, backing onto a scenario of a kitchen, could the office space be turned into a true kitchen at a later date without too much issue? The, the capping of pipes and so on. Right, I don't. Um, I mean, the other thing is you have venting scenarios. Yeah, you need to accommodate right. now with. There's a fair amount of mechanical and plumbing equipment that would be put in place and would have to be reconfigured. Uh, we'd have to account for that within ceiling spaces, um, allow for that reconfigurability. Fortunately, we do have tall ceilings at this level, um, but that the routing of that equipment would have to be uh, coordinated and, and addressed. Sorry, I, I didn't address It is a questions. challenge at this stage to work on a footprint of an unknown, um, and I recognize Council's D difficulty at the moment. Um, so uh, our path to consider an option, knowing the feedback we had from the consultants uh, in the past, the other consultants regarding the business planning aspect, um, the cafe at least provided the scenario of a potential future mm -hmm. private entity potentially coming in and bidding on a cafe scenario, yet while maintaining the functional spaces that have been proposed to date. So the programmer wouldn't have to be shrunk the program and office spaces could stay the same and the washroom locations could stay the same. So in fairness to Councillor Gala, we did go the path of what we felt was most accommodating in, the, in light of not a business case and in light of um, the feedback from the other consultants that we've had to date based on the other amenities and the functionality they see this building being. So. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the information, the background. Um, I do feel that the, the CAF, uh, the way it's suggested in the report to accept at this point, based on that understanding, is probably the right way to go. At this point, what I'm envisioning in the future when this all comes to fruition 
is that we're going to see a lot of little restaurants right around the entire area that we're going to be able to go and I think really enjoy different um, things of that nature. So if we start off with this now to accommodate the buildings uh, that eventually with all the the attractions and the reasons to head downtown that we're going to see a natural uh, little restaurant bar area start to come to fruition which is I'm really really hoping uh, that it will and I'm confident it will actually with this design in front of us so uh, thank you for that ex explanation it helps me very much thanks Councillor Gilliland thank you through Mr. Chair um, I agree with uh, Councillor Humphreys about um, you know going down that path and maybe this is the best way with the cafe uh, for space I mean there was a time um, that I wanted to explore what it was to have a, a restaurant per se to see what those options are. I think what you guys have presented have is a fair assessment of um, the consequence of doing that, um, which I feel you are losing programming space and you are losing space for people to actually sit and eat, 20 to 30 people versus 40 people with an occupancy. So I feel like the cafe option does kind of suit the space. And just a quick question. Um, I know we've had plenty of um, public meetings on this. Was cafes not one of the repeated requests that people wanted to see within this space? Ms. McDougall. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, certainly cafe, a place to grab a coffee, a place to sit, uh, read a book, has been a steady conversation. Um, we also wanted with caution to move forward as we know that the library, which we are hoping to be connected with, physically connected with, has already a concession. Um, and so we were, adverse to try to compete with that, not to mention the fact of uh, the businesses on Young Street. So cafe definitely seemed to be of interest. Um, that space was also demonstrating a benefit for an event space to serve food from, from an event perspective, and potentially even from a licensed event um, that may be in the upper hall to be able to serve uh, alcohol from. So it had many spin-offs as the potential of what that space could be being in a cafe style. Great, and um, I do love the fact that the stairs go into it. I think it makes it more of a marketable space for a vendor, knowing that we're driving traffic through the cafe. It could be a Starbucks, could be something that's a quick, um, a quick snack, quick food, quick. You know, I think nowadays people are um, operating their businesses out of really small spaces, and it'd be amazing what they can cook up in a small space. And I think that this space does give the need to um, what people are asking. Um, other thing I wanted you to clarify was um, I'm really big on the internet connection and chargeability in the stations and I really uh, was hoping that you could just explain to everybody the intention of including um, charging stations for people for the laptops, phones, internet connection in the cafe area as well as in the bridge area and the extra programming space because I think it's important to explain that a bit. Ms. McDougall. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, certainly it's our goal and working with our IT division to ensure this facility um, has IT connectivity, Wi-Fi spaces, and even in the public spaces along the bridge uh, would be viable and an opportunity for us to sh share and promote um, connectedness for families to come and hook up. Um, so it is our goal and work with yet through the future designing as to how that feature can be incorporated. Perfect. Um, Mr. I think you answered all my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Gardner, second time. Thank you. Um, going back to the investment plan, I think um, I think Mr. Gardner said that if we didn't get the grant, that we would think about um, borrowing more money, if I remember the, the part correctly. But in any case, if that or perhaps you could. Mr. Gardner, can you just refresh the conversation around the funding strategy that was presented previously? Uh, the, the general funding strategy, if, if any of the grant money we're, we're uh, planning for didn't come through, we're, we're going to essentially tap into the, the hydro reserve uh, further for every, any lost proceeds that we okay. didn't get from the grant. Thank you. I, I remembered it incorrectly. And. Um, these figures uh, from that report, the, the I believe the hydro fund was said to be $31 million, but we hadn't taken away the money for the armory yet. So I don't know what the actual money is in the hydro reserve fund. It, it may not be more than 
26 million or 27 million. So maybe we could just have that for our, our council report, have all of an update on all of that and, and what that would mean and certainly what that would mean because we're using the hydro money now to decrease operating taxes and uh, build up our reserves. So we should be clear on all of that. Going back to the restaurant versus the cafe, um, I, I think in horror that we would have a, a snack bar like we have at one of our recreation centers. Um, I was thinking more of something like in Montreal or, or in Quebec where you go down the steps and there's fantastic croissant, all kinds of baked goods and light sandwiches and amazing coffee. But I, I do think that, I mean, Councillor Gallo has a point. We, we never did explore the possibility of a restaurant. And if it was a successful restaurant, it could be a moneymaker. So are we, are we just too late in the process to do that? I mean, do we have to decide on the design by the council meeting? Or are we at the wire? Ms. McDougall. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, at this point, to stay on the work plan as proposed, um, in order to meet uh, the conversation and, and direction from Council in July, which is direction to proceed to construction designs, we wouldn't want that direction unless we knew what we were designing. So if there is a study to be done, it would delay um, the process. Time-wise, length of time, it would be a guess for me. Um, if we were to do an expressions of interest um, uh, to communicate what options are, the share the business plan with those potential proponents uh, to get a response back, I would suggest, hypothetically, I would suggest it's going to be a two to three month delay, and then we have to revisit the table with another council report to consider council's direction moving forward. Yes, Gardner. Uh, I'm only one member at the table, but I, you know. We do want to do it to the best of our ability, and I, I think we it would be worth exploring a restaurant uh, feasibility. That's just my own personal view. Uh, I think that's it. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, at the very beginning, I, I was also, um, you know, you know, I had the same you know type of vision that. Uh, Councilor Gallo had, and I know Councilor Humphreys wanted an Italian restaurant. I wanted a Korean one, and and you know we were we we're talking about that, and you know it's it's a nice, it was a great dream to to, to consider, and I think on March 21st, I think it was when um, that uh, those other designers came into play and and said that the likelihood of success of a restaurant within a you know quote unquote performing arts center or, or or similar type of building, municipal building to be successful is, is quite low and and as Council Gallo mentioned, uh, uh, the Mississauga uh, Performing Arts Center and that's one of the uh, examples that uh, they drew upon and, and a couple of others and and they gave reasons why uh, they were not successful and it's hard for municipalities to get into that business or not get directly into that business but partnering with uh, with uh, business partners so you know I, I agree you know it'd be great to kind of you know blue sky everything but given that our you know we're limited in our, our footprint of the building itself um, you know without encroaching upon the library square I'm not sure how we can put enough uh, uh, square footage in a potential restaurant to make it uh, uh, worth it and also you know in terms of the traffic you know we were talking about you know something you know slightly similar about the healthy food option and trying to get a business into our recreation centers to sell uh, healthy foods you know whether it be Starbucks or booster juice um, you know a couple of the businesses um, or some of the contractors said that you know we don't have the traffic uh, during the weekdays to warrant uh, anyone even bidding for uh, a contract or uh, a, le a lease or some kind of an arrangement. So, uh, you know, when you, when you put all those things together, um, I'm not sure if it's worth the extra two or three months to uh, 
to put this project on hold to uh, to blue sky it some more because in the end if we don't have the space it's really hard to kind of blue sky unless we build higher so, um, so I understand <laughs> Councillor Gallo's uh, dreams because that you know that'd be great but I think it gives an opportunity for uh, you know other partners you know surrounding Library Square to kind of step up and, and maybe we can uh, do something with them thank you thank you before I go to Councillor Gardner, uh, Councillor Gallo, I just have a quick question for Mr. Gardner. Uh, when it came to the JOC, Council decided to fund it through Infrastructure Ontario. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, the Council decided to fund the development charge portion of the JOC costs through a debenture from Infrastructure Ontario. So while staff have presented an option for the funding strategy to draw from the reserves, um, council may at any time choose a, an alternative strategy, such as a debenture or anything along those lines, once the final cost has been determined and we know where or how funding may come in, be it through provincial grants, through whether we want to overdraw the or draw from the hydros, or to look at what the current rates are through infrastructure or Ontario or anything like that. While there's structures being proposed today, is what staff are recommending. It doesn't mean that that will be the final say when all is said and done and we award the tender if the council gets to that point. Is that true? Uh, absolutely correct. Thank uh, you. The, I, I believe uh, staff's intent in the fall is to bring back a, a more final funding strategy to council for its approval. Thank you. Councillor Gallo. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just along those, those, those lines, with, with all due respect, uh, the JOC is probably the last building that I would I would use as an example of, of uh, a project that went went well and and as you know we were both on council uh, and and that same strategy was used back then and you can pull out reports the, the same verbiage was used back then that once we know the final cost then we'll figure out how to pay for it it didn't work then and 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 I'm just you know some red flags are going up that that. Um, I don't like that strategy, not at all. Um, this is taxpayer money, um, and we should figure out with a solid plan on how to pay for it, um, not not just when we know what the final cost uh, is. Um, in terms of this food services, you know, I'm really just trying to push the envelope as far as I possibly can, um, because um, I'm of the opinion that we need to turn over every rock and explore every avenue to generate some income um, because this is a big project um, and not only the capital cost but the operating costs uh, and I want to do everything I possibly can to to see where we can generate revenue to ease the burden on the taxpayers and have a wonderful facility that that's my end goal um, and to me we have not explored the option of a restaurant to the degree that we can make a solid decision that it doesn't work and at the end of the day had we have gone through that that process I may be with all of you and say it just doesn't work uh, because of all of this um, but we didn't do that and um, and I don't feel confident that it doesn't work because we didn't we didn't do that um, in terms of this concept of you know re uh, being competition with other restaurants on Young Street let's let's face it the, the the town of Aurora is often in competition with the private uh, sector. We have a, a, a fitness center that is in direct competition with the public sector. This is not something new. Uh, we should be cautious, uh, absolutely, and we should take that into consideration, absolutely. But it is not a reason not to, not to explore um, uh, a revenue source that is, in my view, something that would add uh, an aspect to the, to the um, a whole project that would have been wonderful. Um, it's unfortunate that we're at a timeline that um, in order to, to go down this route, it, it delays it. Um, that doesn't bother me because really, um, in a roundabout way, we'll probably end up knowing whether we get the 14 million and, and it paints a very different picture um, when all of that information is, is, is put together. So. Those are my views. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to stop this project. I'm, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm simply trying to provide suggestions to to make it uh, even better. 
Thank you, Councillor Gallo. In future, I'll refer to the debenture to build the SARC or other buildings rather than the GOC. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, I'll go to Mayor Maracas for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, uh, when we discussed this March 21st, I believe it was, uh, it wasn't, was it not, Councillor Kim? You mentioned March 21st. So when we discussed it, I, you know, I made reference to the fact that when it comes to the financials, if, if you're not comfortable, if you don't believe that this is the right project to spend the hydro funds, the hydro reserve funds on, well, then vote against it. If you believe it is the right project, at the end of the day, we will use those hydro reserves. We are told that there's enough in there for us to, to move forward with this project. If you're comfortable, you think this is the right project for the town at the right time, then it should be a yes. Because we have the funds. The hydro funds were, were there to provide for a community asset. We sold a community asset. We should be providing a community asset back. That's what we're doing here with this project. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we, we just finished talking about it, the last report uh, about intensification within the area and that this has been identified. This is what's going to occur in this area. We are going to have intensification. We're going to have more people coming to the area. With more people, we're going to have those restaurants coming in. And we have a bigger picture for this area. This is part one piece of the puzzle. The restaurants will come in within that, that other corner, within Young Street. From my perspective, there's some things that you leave to the private sector. Restaurants, uh, that's something you leave to the private sector. I don't think we should get into that business. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm comfortable, as I said many times, moving forward with this project. I think it's the right project at the right time for our community, and it will only enhance and better our community and put it on a, uh, on a scale that I think will be unbelievable, and I think the residents' community will thank us 10, 15, 20 years down the road for making this decision. So I'm in favor. Thank you, Mayor Maracas. Councilor Humphreys, for the second time. Uh, Yes, to you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I apologize. I, I'd taken my name down. I just brought it back because Mayor Maracas mentioned what I was going to say. When we started this project years and years ago, we're talking 2010 when we, well, way before then, but uh, 2010 when I came on and uh, we were speaking around the table, we, we were discussing heavily the hydro funds, very important, extremely important uh, funds, and they can only be used for something spectacular, something truly significant that we really believe as a council that we would open that up and use it. And I really believe this is a very special project uh, that is going to be built in the heart of our community. We've talked about this for so many years. So the, um, the funding strategy, absolutely, we have to be careful. We have to understand it carefully. Uh, I was excited to hear how staff presented it, that we'd only be marginally touching the hydro funds if all comes to fruition. And I have a lot of confidence in staff. I know that they've got lots of work done already to get that 14 million. And if that's the case, that's a really huge success story for our town that we'll be able to really showcase how you do a project of this significance and the give back and, the, and, and what comes back to our community. However, as Mayor Maracas so eloquently spoke, um, if we do not get that fortunate, I do believe, and the community has spoken very, very, very many times, that opening that fund uh, for uh, supporting this project would be, um, you know, in their view and in our view, uh, the right way to go. So I'm really excited about that, and I just wanted to share that as well. But I, again, thank you, and looking forward to it uh, moving forward. Thanks. Thanks. Any further comments or questions? Members of Council, hands high, please. Call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? The option is B, was put on the floor. All those opposed? Council Gardner, how do you vote? Yes. You'd like to do the vote again? All those in favor of the motion on the floor? Opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, it is now 9.10. We will call our health break. Thank you. Councillor Gilliland. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I've read this report and uh, I guess just a few questions about it and I guess my big concern with some of the amendments is a couple things is the uh, members list and I was wondering what was the real reason to exclude that um, I look at that and I feel like it really adds um, some accountability to the ratepayers association by including that list uh, I, having been a member of Ratepayers Association, sometimes people just assume that they're on the association if they don't go to the next meeting, and it's not necessarily true. And I think that by having um, a list that's submitted each and every um, year, it, uh, it, it serves some accountability, especially when we're dealing with um, certain issues that are reflecting the, the neighborhood. It's, it's important to kind of know that um, the membership is meets, uh, I guess, the minimum criteria. So what was the reason for, who do I ask? I will direct that to Mr. Durand, the clerk. Who? The clerk. Oh, the clerk, Mr. Clerk. What was the reason for removing that? Absolutely, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the, it was centered around the, re the feedback we got back from the ratepayers associations. Um, one thing they thought uh, wasn't necessary was the, um, the, the resubmission we make them do every year. So we thought, um, you know that you know, this is a, a compromise. Get rid of um, just having to name all the all the people of the Ratepayers Association again. Once they do it off the top, they can confirm to us that they that the Ratepayers Association still meets the requirements of the policy. And so uh, again, we were just trying to um, uh, help out the Ratepayers Association from what we heard from them. Councilor Gilliland. Okay. Um, I still feel there needs to be a sense of accountability by actually having that list. Um, the other thing was the. Uh, da, 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 the minimum requirement for households, and I know that there's been some talk among some ratepayers how they feel that, um, what is it, 10 households? What's the, could you confirm the number of households? So I don't have 10 my 10 households is the minimum. 10? Um, feel that really um, represents necessarily the entirety of a neighborhood, and I don't know if maybe it's been kind of explored to maybe explore percentage versus a number of households just based on density. Um, for example, you have a clause here that talks about um, any RA representing less than 10 households, fewer than 20 requires council exemption. So for an example, you're saying to take that out, but this could reflect, say, a neighborhood along Old Bloomington. There's very few homes, and that might be something that you would consider an exemption. So I kind of feel like we still need to kind of keep the ability to um, either hold the 20 members of left exemption or we got to start looking at percentages so we're reflecting more of a true representation of that neighborhood. So I just feel like there's a little bit more work to be done here. Mr. Duran? Um, you know, I think there, there might be, that's a, you know, an interesting situation you bring up, Councillor. I think there might be, there might be room for um, some exemptions in, uh, in the future. Certainly, if you're brought to council, a, a, sort of, uh, a very weird uh, ratepayers association where it is just a number of bigger lots or anything like that. So, um, you know, we don't mean to, um, to, to restrict anything or restrict anybody, but, you know, it's 10 households. It just seem, it seems like a, we've had that. It's been in place for years, and it seems like a, an appropriate number for, uh, to, to deduce um, sort of the seriousness of an association. Uh, we're happy to take another look at it, though, if, if that's council's will. Um, okay, I mean, I would going? like to see, um, I would like to see a little bit more work on that, so I don't know what my colleagues feel about that, but I, I feel like maybe we should maybe look at exploring more of a percentage base and also allowing, um, you know, the exception of, you know, smaller communities that may only have, say, 20 in the community, and maybe we should be looking at um, an exception rule for that. But uh, maybe I can refer back to staff and uh, let them take my comments. Councillor Gardner. Thank you. Uh, so from the way it's structured uh, now and the way it's proposed to be structured through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Duron, you could have, um, if there's a neighborhood with 600 homes, you could have, like that lady who delegated th tonight, like there could be 10 homes on Royal Road that had um, bigger lots. So they could uh, they could form a ratepayers association and say to council we want to be exempt or we want different. So so it's not. I always thought a ratepayers association represented a whole area. But 
I guess that would be hard to define what a whole area would be. Mr. Drawn, is there any uh, size restrictions around a ratepayer society? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, there's something we are actually, that's one of the reasons the policy is being brought forward is that um, to, to try and define a bit more of the area, uh, we're suggesting uh, one concession block, so the space between um, you know, Bayview and Leslie, uh, being, uh, or maybe, excuse me, Mavernack and, and Bayview would be a better example of, of a, just a, a more confined space. Because I think the, you know, that is the, um, the why you form a Pierce Association is to get the is like-minded um, residents in a single area. So we are trying to, to bring that in a bit more uh, with okay. this policy. And, um, um, thank you. Uh, what would be, it says that, um, I guess before anybody could be a ratepayers association, now it's um, the clerk gets to approve at the clerk's discretion. So, what would be grounds for not approving? Mr. Drawn. I think something like a townwide uh, association, the, the policy might look to, um, to disqualify that. Um, um, other than that, uh, it, you know, it's it's fairly simple. I don't, in, in my time here, we, s we haven't denied any ratepayers associations from forming. So I just thought of another question. So what happens if a, a, a group um, wants to set up to protect turtles? And there's turtles on St. John's, there's turtles on Henderson. Like, could they do that, uh, even though they're a very... Desperate, desperate areas, disparate areas. Different. Thanks, different. <laughs> well, I mean, they're not near each other. They're not a confined Distant. area. Yeah. Mr. Ron. Through you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if I'd classify that as a ratepayers association. Uh -huh. I think we might be able to take care of that through um, other means uh, in terms of, um, you know, maybe outside the town. Uh-huh. Thank you. Councilor Gallo. Council, unless uh, you want to put forward uh, Councilor Gillen's suggestion, referred to back staff with comments, I'll, I'll call the vote. Yep. What? Call the vote or refer back to staff? All in favor? Approved. Next up, item R4. Would somebody like to uh, move this item? The uh, fitness equipment replacement. I need a mover. Councillor Kim, seconder. Councillor Humphreys. Any speakers to this? Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I've spoken to this before during budget. Um, I've done quite a lot of work on this, partly because I've spent a lot of, well, a fair amount of time there. And um, the research that I did, I've got spoke to 20 people that includes me um sorry 19 people including me um which is i don't know how many how many people um how much feedback they got during the the staff got during their exploration but um i think it's about half of what um they got and the only thing people said to me was that the spacing was the same, the, the equipment is way too close together. So adding more equipment is definitely not going to help. I know that you and uh, Mr. Chair, you and Mr. Mayor know that uh, fitness area pretty well. It's, so adding more equipment isn't the answer here. Um, I believe they are talking more about replacing the existing. Replacement. Um, I think I'll bring pictures next week. There's there's a lot of new material, a lot of new equipment there. And I know we have to keep replacing equipment to keep it current, but the only thing that's really old is the rowing machine and it's really used a lot. So I would I don't know if that's in the recommendations from staff. But the only thing that people are talking about, the young people, younger people are talking about functional weights, which was explained to me to be like set filled sandbags that you <laughs> you use to practice what your daily movements would be um, somebody wanted a spinning machine downstairs but um, you know they can go upstairs and use the spinners anytime they want 
and um, people were talking about vertical hanging so there's a little more space for mats and they're also talking about new mats the mats there are absolutely disgusting so I, I can't see why we would want to spend fifty thousand dollars and I'm sorry Mr. Downey's not here I mean Mr. Downey really tried hard to make this into a club but Councillors. Councillor Gardner. Um, I, Mr. Downey tried really hard to make this into a club, but it's not a club. It's a community fitness center. And people come there not because we've got the latest equipment. They come there because it's very um, non-threatening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't have to wear proper clothes. And it's really friendly. And I see people have formed friendships over the years. Um, I don't want to spend money where we don't have to. And um, if you want, I'll bring pictures for next time. But we got some really great new equipment. And um, I can't see where we're going to be spending this $50,000. I figure a, a new rowing machine and mats and some vertical hanging equipment and some functional weights, whatever those actually are, wouldn't cost more than eighteen dollars or $20,000. So um, I can't agree with this report, and uh, it doesn't satisfy <laughs> my, uh, as a conditional report, it doesn't satisfy my voting for to spend $50,000. Thank you. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to uh, Ms. McDougall. Uh, the survey s stated that uh, the, uh, the, cl the customers or residents uh, would prefer to have more flexible equipment and, and more up-to-date or newer equipment. And, and I'm curious as to why none of the, the funds allocated uh, is being directed towards new equipment, new types of equipment, as opposed to just pure, pure replacement. Ms. McDougall. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the equipment that is being replaced, that's being proposed on our list, from an asset management perspective, most of the ones on the list are from 2007. So they are 12 years old. Um, these are predominantly um, the strength uh, machinery uh, that has the weights attached, not cardio equipment. It is predominantly uh, these weight machines. Um, and just based on their, uh, their in, in fair condition, but no warranties left. So when they do fail, they will fail and have to be removed. Um, at this point, based on our asset management plan, um, and to stay on track so we don't lose momentum or at least keep the equipment uh, to a standard the uh, patrons are looking for. And to specifically your question, why are we not buying something unique or new or, or not, yeah, I forget the words you used, innovative. Flexible. Or flexible. That is part of the newer asset. Uh, obviously, the, the assets are, have improved since 2007 uh, to meet more adaptable needs as far as the functionality goes. Um, as far as some of the pieces of equipment, uh, Councillor Gardner, if I may uh, comment on um, concerns with I, I, uh, the mats, um, replacing the mats, the smaller pieces of equipment, um, hand weights, uh, what mats, the smaller amenities are handled through our operating budget. Um, those are things that we can replace when needed, when the time is right. So if there's a concern, I would love the feedback to our staff that that can be done. As far as these, what's presented to Council is to stay on track with our asset management plan and what is being proposed are amenities that are, um, all, most of them are 12 years old. Councillor Kim. Councillor Humphreys. Uh, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Um, in reading the uh, capital projects page on 6 of 7, it does mention a couple of points that um, have me concerned not to move forward with this um, in terms of, you know, the benefits is obviously to replace old and outdated equipment. There's some that sounds not too old, as Councillor Gartner um, did express, from ages 3 years to some that are 15 plus years, and most of the warranties have expired. My concern is from a risk management perspective, although some of that equipment may not appear old to us, it does say that they want this, uh, staff would like this replaced so that old equipment doesn't become a safety risk to members. And I would hate 
for us to be the judge of that. Um, at this point, I, I don't want to have anyone in any kind of uh, safety concerns. So for me, I'd like to move forward with this this evening. Thank you. Um, Ms. McDougall, you know, I am familiar with uh, a number of the ones that are being uh, earmarked for being replaced on of the 14 pieces of equipment. And I guess one of the things that uh, you kind of notice when you go into the Club Aurora a fair bit is, you know, you'll see equipment go offline for whatever reason, the treadmills, some of the bikes and so forth. Uh, but the two rowers, I've never seen them um, uh, ever be out of commission for, for any reason. And I, I understand they're 12 years old. Um, and so I guess I'm just curious about those in particular, whether it's because they're 12 years old or is there any sort of additional information uh, that you're aware of that, uh, predicates them being replaced. I know when we talk about vehicles and we talk about other other assets in terms of the replacement, you know, we may have a, other information about, you know, the cost of constant upkeep and impair and it makes it more of a, a worthwhile thing. But I'm just curious about the two rowers because I'll be honest with you, I've, I've never seen a sign on it saying, you know, out of action. And to me, that means it's still functional and usable. Granted, it is 12 years old, but, you know, I, I just, I guess I'd like to understand a little bit more some of the equipment and the decisions being made, whether or not there's any kind of detailed maintenance history on some of these. Uh, through you, Chair, uh, we, looking at the rowing machines on my list here, there are two rowing machines um, that are noted as only seven years old, and they would not be replaced. So you, there may be uh, two that are time that are due, while the other two are not, I'm suspecting. So I'm, I'm going off of page two, where okay. it says 14 pieces of equipment are scheduled to be replaced in 2019. These include two rowing machines. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know which, which uh, where these rowing machines are, because as far as I know, inside the club, there are the two concept rowing machines, and, and that's, that's it. it. I don't know of any other rowing okay. machines in there. Well, I know there are only two in there, and there's only spaces for two in there. So yes. perhaps that's something you can just uh, okay. inquire about it and get back next I'll week. Clarify for next week, yes. Thank you. Councilor Gardner, for the second time. Through you, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Ms. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Ms. McDougall. Um, I'm sorry I didn't talk to you about it. Uh, You're, yeah, yeah, you can write and listen, I can't. So, um, I mean, do we, it, I, you know, great. we don't want it to be a liability issue, sure. but can we, I mean, can we put this money aside and not use it if we don't need to? I don't, I once in, I mean, once in a while there might be a, um, a machine offline it it was the the bicycles but generally everything seems to be working pretty well nobody's complaining except the young people about the functional weights and i would really like you to have a look at the mats on one of your lunch hour it, they should have been replaced a year ago they are disgusting so i don't know who's responsible for doing that but you know just because something is old um it doesn't mean it's not working well. So could we put that money aside and not use it unless we have to? Ms. McDougall? Uh, officially, I guess that's council's decision if I can approve a pot of money and leave it as a reserve that I can draw on as needed. But just so council understands um, with these, as an example, we don't, just because it hits a certain year, we don't automatically replace. So for example, with them being purchased in 2007, they have a lifespan of 10 years. So technically we're two years beyond that lifespan. So we have evaluated the need a couple of years ago when they hit that lifespan to determine if there was a need for them. And uh, staff deferred the replacement of. We're getting to the stage where the, f the risk might be of um, the, the fear of failure that the machine just has to go. And we wouldn't have the funds unless council did pre-approve a balance for me to draw from um, that I could draw on later. But at this point, there is an evaluation protocol. There are maintenance protocols that we follow. And just because they hit an end or a lifespan, we don't are automatically assume they are to be done. We do evaluate their, their quality before we put that on our list. 
Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. So this could be for next year's report, a capital project that has money left in it and gets returned to source. I guess that question is to Mr. Gartner, Ms. as we've I think just either, Ms. McDougall seen. can answer that. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that's the case. So if there's funds that we did not utilize, they could be returned to source, yes. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, and uh, but the, the question of safety was mentioned. Is, that, is it a liability? Are any of those machines a liability if we don't replace them? Ms. McDougall. Through you, Mr. Chair, I think it's hard to say that it's a liability. I think um, as the weaker of the, the units, as they f begin to fail, there's an immediate risk. But I, it's hard to judge whether we're that close to that element or not. It's hard to say. We Thank prefer you. to be proactive to a degree and get them moved on and uh, life cycled out before that becomes a problem. Thank you. Thank you. See no further questions. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next, R5, the user fee pricing policy. Would somebody like to put the, it on the floor? Councilor Kim, Mayor Maracas, any comments or questions to this one? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Carried. R6, Tamarack Green Park, repaving. Would somebody like to move that? Councilor Humphreys? Councilor Gardner, any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. The Wildlife Park. Who would like to put this on the floor? Councilor Humphreys, seconded by? Councilor Kim, any comments or questions? Councilor Gallo. I'd just like to, um, I'd like to get a, a design, or at least the latest design um, that we're, we're working with. Um, yeah, uh, that would be something that I'd be interested in, in seeing. Ms. McDougall, are you able to provide? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, certainly we can provide the design. Uh, it closely follows the original plan for the park. Um, obviously there's been a little bit of realignment of pathways just due to conditions on site, but um, we are following uh, David Tomlinson's vision as uh, set out in the strat plan um, from 2000 and Thank you, Ms. Date, Team a, while a couple ago. years ago anyways, yeah. um, but certainly we can provide that. Thank you. And uh, uh, offline, I'm, I, I'd actually like to have a, a meeting just so I, I understand um, the difference between what Lake Simcoe is not allowing us and what David had envisioned, just so I clearly understand uh, the, um, the difference. Thank you. But I'll, I'll reach out. Councilor Gardner. Online and offline ponds. It's, I find that is it, the question. I find it confusing. Um, so it's going to the first of all, thank you for being here. Um, it's going to be uh, a five-year construction. So how long will it take before the public can actually use it through you, Mr. Chair? Ms. Team Camp. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it will. Um, we are going out. We're out pretender currently um, for the first phase, which is construction of the pathways and the boardwalk component. Uh, that will be starting construction in June, and we hope to have most of that construction done by the end of 2.19. Uh, there might be a little bit of carryover into 2.20, and then in 2.20 we hope to go out for the pond construction. So ideally, we, some of the um, pathways can, will be able to be accessed in 2.20 by the public. Because this is such a set through you, Mr. Chair, because this is such a sensitive area and we don't want the public wandering through the wildlife areas, how are we going to keep them from doing that? Ms. Tinka. Um, through you mean through the construction phase? Oh is I that mean what you're referring no, to? I mean I mean at the end of the day we it's like we're going to have viewing areas and mm -hmm. blinds and all kinds of things so we don't disturb the wildlife. 
but we're also going to have a trail. So is that just good, is that going to go around the perimeter of the area? Uh, the trail meanders mainly um, through the eastern portion of the park. Uh, there are some side trails that um, follow over to the west side to connectivity through the sure. through the developments. Um, they are on the perimeter of the ponds. They're they're set back um, as far as possible, um, and, but because of the conditions of the lands there, um, there's some significant wetlands, and so we have to take into topography when we're aligning, aligning those pathways. So people are there as far back from the wildlife as possible. Um, and that is as per David's vision, and we followed his uh, plans when, when we were constructing it with the consultants. Thank That's you. Fair. I guess there'll be signage to say, stay on the trail or something. There'll Absolutely. Be, yeah. Thank you. I'd like to see a picture too. It's been a while. Thanks. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Next up is uh, the BIA business plan and project. Would a member council like to put up? Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Gallo. Any speakers to the report? Seeing none. All those in favor? Oh, Councillor Gardner. Could um thank you. Um, I'm not sure who it would, it would be. Could somebody explain to me on page one in order to allow for the collection of the final non-residential tax billings is necessary to pass a bylaw to outline the proposed levy? Mr. Nadaroff, it's um, would you under like executive summary of the last line. Do you, Mr. Chair, I'll take a stab at this. Uh, uh, under the BIA um, uh, Act or the portion of the Municipal Act that includes BIAs, I guess, um, the final step of getting the levy assessed is for Council to pass a bylaw because it actually gets assessed as on their tax bill. And so uh, it, uh, the Council has to endorse it. Thank Council you. Carter. And did we, uh, on page two, um, there the BI is requesting access to approve streetscape funding. Did we actually put aside $150,000? Is it actually somewhere sitting in a, a fund? Because I don't think we approved it. No, I think the, the streetscape has a budget associated to it, and we've been talking about it since me and you were starting since remember. 2010. So I think it's part of the, 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 uh, the total t dollars associated with it. But there should be a, a report coming forth, I believe. Correct, Mr. Natarazzi? Thank you. Yes, to you, Mr. Chair. Any other requests would have to come through Council. But, but have we put aside $150,000 in some reserve fund? Jason. Uh, Councillor Gardner, uh, Mr. Gardner. Uh, the money that they're looking at accessing is a 2019 project that's currently conditionally approved. There's some funding in there for banners and stuff of that nature uh, around town, and they're looking at accessing some of that money uh, once the condition has been lifted on the project. So there will be a subsequent pro oh. report come. So the, that's. Specific project, but but that's the that's what Mr. Nadaraz that's what you're talking about bringing a report to us. Yeah, so when the report comes, lift the condition. I'm sure okay. mention of that requirement will come up in the report. Thank you. I just I just I mean it's talking about one hundred fifty thousand dollars in the report, and I don't remember ever approving that. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Next up is Capital Project 42072, the Van Dorf Side Road Culvert and Ditch Repair. Would somebody like to put that on the floor? Oh, Councillor Humphreys, you're so great tonight, everything. Councillor Gilliland? Councillor Humphreys, the floor is yours. Through you, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm in support of, the, of this motion. Just a question, there's been some concerns um, on the Van Dorf Star Road in terms of safety. Will this be included in some of the expense in terms of doing this work on Van Dorf Side Road? Have you heard of 
Anything like that? Mr. Waters? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, my understanding is this is just for the culvert just replacement. Just for culvert? Yes, okay. I understand. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll follow up later on the safety issue. Yeah. Councilor Gardner. Uh, thank you. Page two. It says the pro this project was approved by town council as part of the 2018 capital budget with an approved budget of $130,000. So that wasn't just for the design of the project. It, we, we approved the whole thing. Mr. Waters. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's correct, Councillor Gartner. The original study budget, uh, project budget was $130,000, and 23 of that was for the design stage. So um, we, we, we never acted on that budget because we, we came across these additional problems? Through you, Mr. Chairman, we have acted on the budget. We have sourced about, if you go to the table on page three, you can see the funds right. committed for design have been about $23,000. So that's where we discovered that the culvert needed to be replaced through the design phase. I guess the question is why didn't it, and you wouldn't know, but why didn't this come back to council in 2018 if it was a 2018 budget item? Mr. Why? Waters, can you speak to the timing with regards to what, or Mr. Natarasi? Um, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I'll try to respond to the councillor's question. Um, the work was undertaken actually in 2019 um, where a consultant was retained to begin the design work and through that uh, design work, the uh, damage culvert the additional damage culvert was identified. So this only really came to light recently, is another word you're saying. Thank you. Councilor Gardner? I'm sorry, the report says 20, May 2018, the design. Uh, anyway, um, it's, uh, it's confusing to me why we're discussing it um, at this point in 2019 and it didn't come to us in 2018 as part of the project, as part of the, as it was a budget project then. Any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Last item tonight, R10, the amending zoning bylaw. Would somebody care to put that on the floor? Councilor Gillen, Councilor Kim. Any comments or questions to this item? Seeing none, Councilor Gallo. Um, could, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, could uh, Mr. Waters just go through uh, the height? Um, I'm just, I'm interested in hearing the rationale as to um, it, um, it being uh, minor in, in nature to increase from 10 to 12.6 meters in, in height. Mr. Waters, can you speak to the um, increase? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my understanding is um, when the application was first submitted, um, the uh, height was measured um, from the ground floor versus average grade, um, which resulted in a 10 meter height limit. Um, through um, the um, further evaluation of the uh, proposal um, following council's, I guess, approval and principle of the zoning bylaw, um, it was discovered that the average, gra uh, the average grade uh, that was used to measure second time around came up with higher um, uh, increases in height. The built form stays the same um, the, um, uh, as proposed initially. What has resulted is the grades um, of the site have uh, slightly increased the heights of the uh, of the townhouses. Councilor Gallo, not sure I understand that. Uh, um, I, I guess my 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 point is that um, if there's a change of that degree, um, I'm just trying to understand how we determine what would go through the Committee of Adjustment for a minor variance uh, and what internally we can deem as um, something minor and, and, and Council can, I guess, move it forward. Mr. Waters, you are able to elaborate on why it's here before us as opposed to going through a Committee of Adjustment or something else? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's our opinion, uh, or actually my opinion, that the, um, the increase in height is minor in nature and that the uh, initial 
built form um, is the same that was uh, first presented uh, to council for in the zoning bylaw for uh, for adoption back in September. So. Um, Going through a variance, uh, in my mind, would essentially just uh, delay the project. It's, it would still be the same um, development. So we felt that uh, it was appropriate to uh, suggest that the, uh, recommend that the height was minor in nature. Councillor Gallo? I guess my question, yeah, or my, I don't know if it's a concern or not, but it, uh, it, you know, if, if it had originally come before council at uh, 12.6 metres, you know, would council have done something differently back then and, and said no, comply? I mean, it, we're, we're, we're kind of taking that away from the original council decision to move this, this forward. And, and I guess I'm struggling with that minor in nature and who determines and um, if, it was, if it was originally um, higher, what, what would council have, have, have said back, back then? So that's my struggle. Councilor Carter. Um, 2.6 uh, on 10 meters, going from 10 meters to 12.6 meters at the highest point, that's a 25% increase. So we're approving a 25% increase on, s the consultant wants to speak, but I mean, if it's if we only allow a 10 meter height, and we're going to allow in some parts of this project a 12.6 meter height, that's about a 25 percent increase, and I don't know how that can be considered minor. And uh, uh, and th again, it was before you, Mr. Waters, but the the. The reason that this happened, the, the reason that's given that this happened is on the bottom of page four, and it's that the uh, developer um, didn't know what the town zoning bylaw definition for measuring height was and measured it in a different way. So I mean, wouldn't planning staff and building staff have have told the developer that you know it's it's we measure height um, from average grade. I, I just find this all very strange, um, Mr. Waters. With regards uh, to sta staff informing the applicant, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, I can't speak to what staff did or did not advise the applicant when the uh, right. application was first submitted. Um, but I would have hoped that uh, in preparing the, um, the application that the consultant would have uh, read the bylaw correctly. Thank you. So, so that didn't happen. The bylaw wasn't read correctly and, um, and this came to council and because the applicant didn't read our bylaw correctly, they measured the height to top of roof um, from the ground floor, and that gave us gave them a 10 meter height. And now we're told all this time later that no, they misunderstood our zoning bylaw, and now they're coming to ask for um, an increase of a one from 1.1 meter to 2.6 meters over what we allow. Uh, to me, I, I know I can see the applicants going crazy in the audience, but to me, this is just, this shouldn't have happened, and we just can't say, well, okay, it happened, and we're just going to let you do it, because I think it's pretty terrible precedent. Any further comments or questions? Oh, Councillor Gallo. Um, through you to Mr. Waters, what options would we have? Um, this is obviously one. Um, could Council uh, refer to the Committee of Adjustment and have it go through that process? Um, is that an option for us? Um, Mr. Waters? <clears throat> through you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, Mr. Chairman, you have a couple options. You can 
um, refer it back to staff and we can amend the bylaw to 10 meters and then the applicant would have to go through committee of adjustment if they wish to uh, build what they're proposing. Um, that's your one option. Like our option is to basically to approve it um, is another option that you have. Um, so there's a two options on the table. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll you know think of this between now and next week. Thank you. Seeing nothing further, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Hands high, please. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is defeated. And that brings to a conclusion the regular agenda. Um, next week, you'll have certainly opportunity. It, it is just GC. We have no notice of motion, but uh, there was a, a motion uh, added to the agenda, so please take note of it. No. no, no Next week you can speak to it. No, I don't want to oh, you can do it on a new business, though. Starting on new business on my left. Mayor Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, we've been dealing with a lot of issues uh, in the Highland Gate uh, development area. Uh, last year, we were dealing with a lot of issues in regards to, I, mean, I guess at the end of the day, you want to call it property standards, uh, overgrown grass, weeds, uh, the upke uh, upkeep of the, uh, of the area. Uh, they did finally respond, did make some, uh, some adjustments. They took care of the area. Uh, but uh, I think we need to get on top of them uh, now, ahead of it. Uh, before it gets bad uh, it is somewhat bad right now um, so uh, mr. waters if we can get in touch with them uh, I, th I think that uh, uh, the developers need to understand that they need to adhere to our, our construction mitigation plan um, and then also uh, I was looking through the um, the uh, minutes of settlement and under I believe it's schedule G uh, section 37 it speaks to the fact that uh, that all lots and or blocks on the M plan to be left vacant for longer than six months and all portions of public highways that are not paved together with all drainage swales shall be graded, seeded and or sodded and maintained to the satisfaction of the town. And so my question is, is that if we can look into that and if that is the case of the way I'm reading it, um, the uh, I'm, I'm just thinking specifically in regards to the the uh, the one, one parcel that is uh, between Cranberry Lane and Marsh Harbor um, that's just sitting there and it's basically, it's a mud pit. Uh, you know, if I'm reading this correctly under the minutes of settlement th that it's been sitting vacant longer than six months. And my, my uh, uh, from what I've been told is that there's no plans to move forward on, on that section uh, until properties are sold. Uh, so if I'm reading this correctly, as I said, I, I would expect them and for the town to expect them to seed sod the area so it doesn't stay a mud pit. And, and I would also include the, the other area where the houses are supposed to be built and they, are, they currently have seven, but if they're not gonna continue on after the grading is done, uh, if, if they're waiting for, for each one to be sold before they start to break ground, they need to sod and seed that area. Uh, because at the end of the day, we have residents living in the area and they can't be living in a construction zone for like five, 10 years. Um, so if, if this is in the minutes, minutes of settlement and if, it's, if it is the way I'm reading it, well then we need to do something about it and enforce it. So I, I, I'd appreciate it if you can take a look into it for me. Thank you. Councilor Gardner. Thank you. Uh, with respect to my notice of motion through you to Mr. Waters, um, I didn't put anything in about an uh, an FOI in the notice of motion. So I'm wondering if there's a follow up from the meeting with the residents. The FOI is in Freedom of Information. Yeah. I think that's is, best is there a the follow clerk. up from the, from the um, residents as to whether we need to get an FOI for the information? Oh, I'm Mr. sorry, Drone, maybe that you is your, your question. Your, yeah. Certainly, I'd, I wasn't involved with Mr. Waters right. in the, in the <laughs> it, 
Mr. Walters. Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we third or May 5th, something like that. Um, and uh, at that time, I advised them that it would likely be an FOI um, required uh, for the data. Um, I don't believe I was um, asked to, uh, well, I don't believe I was sort of, I don't think I got a response from the residents after that. Oh, I thought, sorry, I thought you were going to find out if we could do it without an FOI. Uh, I believe I checked with uh, the town clerk and he re responded that an FY would be a notice, notice of motion would be required. Council Carter. There's nothing. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, but you suggested I take out the FOI from the notice of motion, so. Uh, just to um, supplement with Mr. Water said, the, the reason that FOI is required is because the, do the data that was provided to the consultant has um, numerous bits of personal information uh, attached to it, phone numbers, um, you know, uh, housing details and things like that. So that if the raw data was to be provided, it definitely would need to be through the FOI process. However, um, I thought that, you know, a reasonable um, compromise might be a, a methodology report from the consultant, which um, would be a notice of motion from you. So that's the genesis of the, the notice of motion. Thank you, Mr. Duran. Councilor Carter? Uh, maybe I'll have to go back to you, Mr. Clerk, because um you can't do my motion if you don't have the raw data. So we can talk about it after the meeting. Anything else? Um, no, I just, uh, again, I'm not sure who would be the person about uh, the train whistling. Is that something that Mr. Nadarosny, are you bringing forward to council at any point? Mr. Nadarosny? Uh, I have to confess I did not follow up on that, but I will. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, Kim. I had clarification to my comments made at last week's uh, council meeting regarding the ward system. Uh, I mentioned the uh, governance review committee did not officially, or the governance review committee did not officially endorse the ward system, and I may have misconstrued that last week. Uh, the ward system was not included in their mandate as there was insufficient time to have a bylaw passed by December 2017 in order to be effective for the next election. However, the Governance Review Committee did recommend that should Council wish to go in that direction, they should investigate that path at the beginning of the new term, which is what we voted on uh, last week. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Humphreys. It's a good question. Is there going to be work starting again under the bridge on the south end of town? Because I just noticed it's just a mess again, and people are going to... Is that going to happen soon? Does anyone know? Do you, Who, Mr. Chair? Who's aware of that? And when, because it's a, it's a mess. Is that ever going to get fixed? Oh, looks like Mr. Natarosti. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the region is about to commence work in that area. Okay. So the Just region's making a mess? It's a different region, but it's for a different region. Can we charge them a 4% cleanup fee? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a nuisance. Thanks. Councillor Gilliland. Thank you. Just real quick. Um, just recently, maybe some of you have noticed that the U.S. has finally lifted the tariffs on steel coming to Canada. And with that, I know we recently had passed an approval for a budget for a tractor mower to accommodate the extra um, money for on this tariff. And I just wonder if it's in our best interest to maybe um, wait, uh, wait that out and refer back to staff to get a new quote based on maybe the new pricing on this tractor mower. Um, is that something I would go through you, Mr. Nadarowski, to staff? Mr. Nadarazzo, can you speak with procurement and perhaps uh, update council? Great. That's all. That's it. Thank you. We have no closed session tonight, so I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Council Gill and <laughs> Council Gallo, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.